CNA Leadership Summit 2022 spotlights the achievements of women in the political, social, and economic arenas. Join our panel of women leaders in the public and private sectors as they share their thoughts and experiences navigating the pitfalls of gender inequality in society and at the workplace. How can we challenge the status quo, break glass ceilings, and inspire positive changes that would drive greater gender equality and empowerment? The CNA Leadership Summit 2022, Women Inspiring Change, organized by Mediacorp. Official partner, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada. Official car partner, BMW. Supported by Google. Each day, we strive to drive, shape, and improve our world. What we do now as women, as leaders, doesn't just influence today. It provides a platform for a more equitable future. The trust we build through understanding and listening. The opportunities we help create for other generations. They are all the start of a journey. We believe that on any journey, we can only move forward when we know where we stand and what we stand for. Graduating around the height of COVID was a really challenging situation. I applied for a lot of jobs, but I didn't hear back from any of them. The Google Skills Ignition Singapore program is a very strategic partnership between Google and the Singapore government for us to structure training around emergent skills uh, in cloud computing, digital marketing. After completing the program at Google, I was very fortunate to land a job at the end of the day. You will have definitely learned something important about yourself from it. Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you here at the Shangri-La Hotel for the CNA Leadership Summit 2022, Women Inspiring Change. Our event today comes to you on live stream on YouTube. And of course, it is International Women's Day, a day to celebrate the achievements of women all over the world, all over the region, both in so the social sphere, economic, the political sphere as well. But there are challenges to what women face today. Our event hopes to be a platform to answer some of those challenges and to inspire change. Now, some of the key questions we're going to be asking today, is gender inequality still prevalent here in Asia? Are women still underrepresented, perhaps, in those boardrooms? Are they making those decision-making roles uh, as much as they should be in 2022? And also, has the pandemic from the past two years affected women disproportionately in all of those spheres and at home as well? Well, there's plenty to unpack, and to do that, we've got some very notable individuals with us here today, both from the political sphere, from the social sphere as well, and from the corporate sphere. Those women from the boardrooms, they've come here today to talk to us about what they can do to inspire change for women around the world. Now, Today on YouTube Live, we're going to bring you some snippets of CNA's coverage of this topic. Uh, coming up, we're going to have a trailer of our latest series. It's called Standing on Her Shoulders. It's going to feature four diverse women here in Singapore. They've all pushed the boundaries in their different spheres in their, and in their own unique ways. And not only them, we're going to meet some other women as well. The women on whose shoulders they stood, the inspiration they had because we could all do with more help. And there are role models too. The series is, looks at the challenges as, as well that are faced by women and how they have overcome them. Let's take a look. Women standing on the shoulders of giants. She is leading by example. From Sarah, I learned a lot about writing your own story. With Yi Shen, I mentor her because we're both women in a male-dominated industry. She is more than a boss. Kim has shown me that it is possible to do well and still have a life. With Cheryl, it goes beyond just talking about work all the time. She is overcoming barriers. 
Liang Glove really made me feel like I was not alone. Teardra, we really did explore what we really wanted to do in life. And she is driving change. Liana, she's such an expert. I have huge respect for her. Sophia has done really, really interesting, really great work with us supporting women in tech. Standing on her shoulders, premiering 8th March on CNA. Well, that was a trailer from Standing on Her Shoulders, a new four-part series featuring some very special women. That's going to premiere tonight on CNA at 7.30 p.m. Singapore, Hong Kong time. Don't miss that. Women today, they are breaking those glass ceilings in the boardroom. Consulting firm Deloitte, seventh edition of the Women in the Boardroom, uh, which is a global perspective on this, includes updates on 72 countries on gender diversity in those boardrooms. It was published last month. And joining me right now for a closer look at that study and the, what they found is Sia Gekchu. She is Southeast Asia Boardroom Program Director at Deloitte. Welcome, Gekchu. It's good to see you here today. Thank you. Let's talk about some of those numbers, those all-important numbers from that study. It found the global average of 19.7% of board seats are held by women. Uh, it is an increase from 2018, so that's an improvement. Southeast Asia saw an increase of 2.7% since the year 2018, though. The figures seem optimistic, but why is there still this big discrepancy compared to the experience of our male counterparts? Okay, since the Deloitte Woman in the Boardroom report was launched in 2011, that's the inaugural report, we have seen that the progress is very slow. If this progress is to maintain every two years, we would only see gender parity in the boardroom in 20 years' time. So the pace definitely needs to be picked up. And the reason for this progress is mainly due to family obligations and responsibility, unconscious biasness in boardroom recruitment process, and generally a lack of sponsorship and gender-inclusive conscious uh, mindset. And traditionally, you're aware boards are more male-dominated. And women tend to potentially lack the confidence of stepping up and putting their hands up. And due to our many other roles, we may also lack that visibility due to lesser networking opportunities. Yeah, it's all about uh, getting out there as well. And, 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 and even from years ago, the people you know and the connections that you make can make all the difference as well. You've said that 2022, though, could be this big year of change uh, for women. And I want to talk to you about that because where there is opportunity, women really can sort of plug the gap. They can make their voices heard. And it, it needs that. It mm -hmm. needs women to stop self-silencing yes. in some ways, something that we, we don't necessarily say we do. But in our hearts and minds, we, we, may, we may actually be prone to it. And it happens over time, right, because of our life circumstances. So tell us more about that. What kind of support can actually be given to accelerate the progress that we're seeing? I think broadly, leaders must recognize, advocate, and actively advance gender parity in the boardroom. So institutional support such as flexible working uh, arrangements and um, sponsorship program for women is critical to progress the speed pace itself. And within organization, setting the tone at the top is very, very important and likely at the board level. This can then be extended to management who is responsible and accountable to develop an inclusive culture and a diverse workforce within the organization. And within the organization, leaders should also encourage women to take up more leadership position and also equip future women leaders with the necessary skill. So in Deloitte, we advocate women in leaderships through our Deloitte Women Boardroom Program as well as the Deloitte CXO programs. The amount of time that those women stay in those positions, though, get you, that's also something that we have to look at because getting them to take on those bigger roles, the roles that require more responsibility is one thing, but you want them to be able to endure in the positions. So let's talk about that because the Deloitte findings also saw that the tenure of women in board seats, in Southeast Asia specifically, has either remained or it has seen a decline. We don't like that. A decline is not good. We want to see those numbers 
be more robust. So what do we do about that? Why is that so in the first place? That they mostly, uh, it decreased most sharply in Singapore specifically, from five years to 4.4 years. Tell us why we're seeing that. So usually a decline in tenure may not be positive, but in, in this case, it is slightly on a better light because it could be due to more women on the board. Simply put it because um, recently there is an increase in board of women in the board representations. Because of that increase, it also means that they have less time to accumulate experience. And also coupled with um, more women rotating out or retiring from their board seats, being replaced by other women, it also further declined the average tenure. Let's talk about you very quickly, Gekchu. If Is your experience different from what we've talked about? Tell us about your journey. I don't think my experience is any different from any other people. But I find my journey very fulfilling because I strongly believe in a strong support of network. Um, when I started my career in Deloitte, I am very fortunate to have many opportunities and flexibility in developing my career. And of course, I think we need to be a bit more risk-taking, putting out our hand for things that we believe we can and strongly want to do. And at the same time, with the support from the family, my colleagues and peers, and my supervisor, I believe we can achieve much more. So I'll encourage women who are starting out in their careers to look out for mentors and sponsors. So sponsors is slightly different from mentors. It's because they know your merit, your strength, and what you want. And they will strongly advocate for you and help you to seize the opportunity that you need in your career. Having that support is important. Gekchu, thank you very much for that. Sia Gekchu there from Deloitte. Well, the role of women at home and in society as well has evolved significantly over time. There's been a lot of change. We have to thank the fearless women who've come before us, the women who were the trailblazers, who beat that path towards equality, towards getting things done the way that they needed to be done for future generations of women. The 19th and the 20th centuries saw a lot of that change. Here's a quick look at one of CNA's documentaries, Every Woman. In today's Singapore, women hold their own as equals, leaving their mark in almost every field. 200 years ago, the opposite was so, as social restrictions born of gender stereotyping made women second-class citizens. I think the most important thing is, in those days, about 200 years ago, girls were really not being valued at home. Poor families would happily sell their girls as slaves in order to keep alive. Girls at the time did not have access to formal education, didn't have um, access to employment. Uh, they were often seen as liabilities by families, so marriage was often one way in which they could ameliorate their own struggles of raising a daughter by marrying her off to someone who could uh, ostensibly take care of her um, and her needs. In the same way that Singaporeans fought against colonialism, women here fought to achieve gender equality. We will be strong and we will change laws. Singapore 1955. The city mostly has recovered from World War II. Now the push is on for self-governance and participation by women in all areas of society. As it did worldwide, the war in many ways freed women from traditional roles. With no fathers or husbands at hand, women took care of themselves, their families, and their communities. We see them volunteering for jury service. We see them being appointed as justices of the peace. We see them volunteering to man the feeding centers, setting up many kinds of associations. They begin to realize that women's rights are also human rights. So when Mrs. Foster came to Singapore in the 1950, this was all happening, you know, so the, the situation in Singapore was just right. There was a ferment and women were ready. 1955 sees the city hold its first general election after being granted partial internal self-governance. 
all adult residents, men and women, are automatically registered to vote. The female turnout is a letdown. In 1959, voting becomes mandatory. Candidates pursue the women's vote. In 1961, the Singapore Assembly enacts the Women's Charter, a year before the United Nations endorses a similar measure. Every woman shall have in her own use her own surname and name set, have and to hold as her separate property, whosoever husband and the wife shall have equal rights in the running of the matrimony. The women of Singapore have accomplished what it will take their sisters elsewhere much longer to do. A powerful and inspiring step back in time there with CNA's documentary, Every Woman, the trailblazers in Singapore's history. And of course, the women who worked to pass the Women's Charter back in 1961 most of you probably not born at that time, but it was an important chapter for us women in Singapore's history, and it turned the pages on the rights of uh, women, protecting the rights of women and girls here in Singapore. All right, next up, we're going to speak to RBC's Tay Hui Leng. She's also one of our panelists later on at the summit. Hui Leng, good to see you here today. Thank you for having me. So Hui Leng, a, a recent report by RBC, let's talk about that because it takes a look at the representation of women at the executive level, and it saw that that's increased. The number is looking healthy enough mm -hmm. from 2014 figures at least. Yeah. What did RBC actually do to get more women on board? Well, to start off, I think we just have to focus on attract and retain. Um, and at the bank, at the so. I think I shared yesterday, also at Asia First, that the values are really important and the bank actually does that very well. And um, diversity and inclusion being one of the pillars um, of our key values, our core values. And so, um, and what do we do? So globally, starting at the global level, um, they set a 50% a target for hiring of new executive appointments to be filled with women. And I think that, that says a lot and that's a tone from the top, you know, and Following that locally, we actually have a, to, we actually ensure that there is a diverse representation at the interviewing um, panel and um, candidates pool 50-50 and as well as promote equal opportunities for promotion and uh, progression to the next level um, for our, our internal employees. And so, and what do we do further to retain is to provide environment where there is equal opportunities of growth, roles that are challenging. You know, um, so this all help in getting more and more women on board and not just get them on board, but that they will stay with the organization as well. Huilin, you're one of those trailblazers in the banking sector. You, you've had so many years of experience with a number of banks as well. What are we going to do to get more women in these management roles? Personally, um, a view of mine is that it starts with recruitment, you know, hiring. And the hiring criteria really has to shift a little or maybe significantly um, over time. So I think a lot of us, if we do know right, our resumes, we, we go by sequential of years of experience. And I think that we might have to look a little beyond that to look at qualities, qualities that actually women do possess in, on top of all these experiences. Roles evolve. And I mean, a lot of um, roles has been has been held by men in the past. So obviously, in terms of resume, you see them possessing those kind of experiences. But if we could just give women out there who possess those qualities as well, like empathy, having a mentoring heart, being able to orchestrate, you know, the talents, um, and them, who have demonstrated a nurturing and ability to influence, these are really powerful qualities that we can actually see that differentiate a leader from being just a regular leader to a good one. So I think that would be a good start in um, bringing about a positive change to having more women on leadership roles. Well, Huilin, you know, what are some of the things, though, that might be holding back uh, women from these roles, though? Because the will might be there, uh, yeah. but uh, it's tough for them to actually break through some barriers. What do they need to do? You know, um, I'd like to give you this analogy, if I could, um, of a sprout, right? So you have um, 
a little sprout growing and it nourishes and it grows and it hits the ceiling. And so the ceiling in our society, in, in what we are talking about in this topic today, is really the social expectations of what a woman should be doing, the priorities, right? And the roles that should be filled by what kind of gender. So these are the ceiling. But upon hitting the ceiling, the sprout can ask two questions, right? One is that, oh no, I don't think I can survive hitting the ceiling. If I break the ceiling, I may not survive the heat from the sun. On the other hand, it can say this, ask this question. If I break the ceiling, I am limitless, you know, I can, I can really power through to the sky. And to answer that question, right, I think that, you know, we as women, we should not put that hurdle in our brain. You know, as we experience any setback, actually, to be honest, right, you and I would know, it's not just women men alike, everyone, you experience hurdles in your life. It's your own mindset to want to overcome them that matters. We need to have uh, better conversations with ourselves and, and have that honesty as well. Hui Ling, thank you so much for okay. that. Uh, we've been speaking there to Hui Ling from RBC. All right. Well, in a few months, moments, we're going to be taking you straight back into the ballroom here at Shangri-La Hotel. It's just behind me. That's where we're going to be kicking off today's event. It wouldn't be possible, though, to be here and do all of this without our valuable partners. We just want to take a moment to thank those partners. Official partner, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada. Official car partner, BMW, and supported by Google. Each day, we strive to drive, shape, and improve our world. What we do now as women, as leaders, doesn't just influence today. It provides a platform for a more equitable future. The trust we build through understanding and listening. The opportunities we help create for other generations. They are all the start of a journey. We believe that on any journey, we can only move forward when we know where we stand and what we stand for. Graduating around the height of COVID was a really challenging situation. I applied for a lot of jobs, but I didn't hear back from any of them. The Google Skills Ignition Singapore program is a very strategic partnership between Google and the Singapore government for us to structure training around emergent skills uh, in cloud computing, digital marketing. After completing the program at Google, I was very fortunate to land a job at the end of the day. You will have definitely learned something important about yourself from it. We've heard from two inspiring, wonderful ladies. It's time to get the perspective from our male counterparts as well, the guys' side of the view. And uh, for that, we're welcoming our guest, Mr. Lien Chunluen. He is general manager at Gojek. Welcome, Lien. It's good to see you here today. Uh, tell us, Lien, on Gojek's part, what has the company done to actually narrow the gap as far as diversity is concerned? Hi, Don. Um, first, on International Women's Day, I'd like to congratulate all the women out there, as well as their allies. Um, let's say at Gojek, maybe I like to look at it from two different perspectives. The first is, what do we do for the customers, the merchants, the drivers to keep them safe? And then second, what do we do at, at a corporate level? Um, as you know, Gojek offers a lot of services and ride. So just fundamental safety. So Gojek Shield to ensure that we've got um, verified driver accounts, ensure that there's number masking, a lot of the things which your male passengers may, may take for granted, but is actually critical for both female drivers or female passengers. So that is on the customer side. I think on the corporate side, um, you know, one interesting anecdote when I was asked about uh, inclusion and, in, inclusion and uh, equality, almost every single one of my direct reports are female. My head of ops, head of trust and safety, head of strategy for rider and driver, they, they're all female. In fact, paradoxically, only the, my marketing head is, is, is a guy. So within Gojek, whether it is um, employee uh, resource groups, you know, women at Gojek, whether it is thinking about smaller things to minimize the frictional downside 
do we have um, mother, you know, um, mother care rooms when we did our renovation? We've moved twice in the past three years. And I think one of the critical things was, what are some of the smaller friction points that we can at least take care of to ensure that we um, provide for our female colleagues, my, my, my colleagues that have gone off on maternity, I don't think that any of them have felt disadvantaged or felt that um, they didn't have a place to come back to after they finished their maternity. So in both ways, big and small, from the upside to the downside, I think we mm. try our best to ensure that it's a very welcoming environment for our female colleagues. What about the pathway for senior leadership at Gojek over the next 10 years? What are we looking at, Lian? Um, I think it's true that tech in general could be much more represented with, with women. Um, as I said, if I look at my direct reports, all my minus ones or the ones I work with, they're all female. So very clearly, the next wave Seeding a wave like that will mean that whether they stay in the company or go out and start their own thing in future, you know, uh, we will have a good crop of female leaders in, um, that can potentially lead. Um, the head of our food business unit in Gojek, Catherine, I mean, she's a lady, so actually we do have female senior leaders uh, within the company. Lynn, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us here at the CNA Leadership Summit. Thank you very much. The Lynn there from Gojek. Thank you. Okay, well, I have just received word that uh, the event in the ballroom is about to start. Uh, we're kicking things off with an address by MediaCorp CEO Tam Lok Keng. Uh, Yasmin Yonkers is going to be next here at. Uh, our live stream YouTube session. I will see you, though, in the ballroom later on when I sit down uh, with a chat with Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa. Strive to drive, shape, and improve our world. What we do now as women, as leaders, doesn't just influence today, it provides a platform for a more equitable future. The trust we build through understanding and listening, the opportunities we help create for other generations, they are on the start of a journey. We believe that on any journey, we can help them move forward. We know where we stand and what we stand for. The Google Skills Ignition Singapore program is a very strategic partnership between Google and the Singapore government for us to structure training around emergent skills uh, in cloud computing, digital marketing. After completing the program at Google, I was very fortunate to land a job at the end of the day. You will have definitely learned something important about yourself from it. CNA Leadership Summit 2022 spotlights the achievements of women in the political, social, and economic arenas. Join our panel of women leaders in the public and private sectors as they share their thoughts and experiences navigating the pitfalls of gender inequality in society and at the workplace. How can you challenge the status quo, break glass ceilings, and inspire positive changes that would drive greater gender equality and empowerment? Good afternoon, one and all. Nice to see you. Happy International Women's Day. A round of applause for everybody here. 
The thing is, we made it into a ballroom. How nice is that, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to wish a very warm welcome to our guest of honor, Mrs. Josephine Teo, who's the Minister for Communications and Information and Second Minister for Home Affairs. Mrs. Teo, welcome. <laughs> also, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of Media Corp, welcome to the CNA Leadership Summit 2022. The theme is Women Inspiring Change. We know you're all very busy, so it's amazing that we managed to get you all here and everybody was on time. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we'd also like to thank our partners. That would be RBC, Royal Bank of Canada. Round of applause for them. BMW. Welcome, BMW. And also Google for supporting this summit. So my name is Yasmin Yonkers. You might have spoken with me at some point on CNA 938 because I interview all sorts of people on uh, the radio program that I host with Arnold Gay. Um, it's called Asia First, and I also host the Double X Files on the same channel that's at 9 a.m. That's when we talk about women's issues. We've had it for quite a while, and uh, it's been quite insightful. Uh, and there's also Money Mind when uh, my colleague Don Tan is unavailable. I pop in to host that one. Okay, before we proceed, um, I'd like to just highlight some small reminders due to safety measures today. I know we've heard this many, many times, but we're just going to try and get through this list. Um, it's to please keep your mobile phones on silent mode. Uh, keep your masks on as well when food or drink um, is... Uh, not going to be served at the table, so meaning unless you're eating or you're drinking, uh, mask on, please. Uh, you're in two zones, so no intermingling between zones, and do keep your networking to stipulated zones. We're also going to be taking questions today uh, for the illustrious people who will be coming on stage. So you have a say. Uh, please feel free to scan that uh, pigeonhole QR code that you see on your tables, and there's a password. It's no secret. I'll give it to you now. That's CNA. 8 Mar, as in March, <laughs> CNA 8 M A R, send us your questions there. It is the third CNA Leadership Summit that we're having here at uh, the Shangri La. We're very proud. The theme changes every year. Uh, it's a hybrid event, so this summit is also currently streamed on CNA YouTube. Our audiences here in Singapore, um, our colleagues back in Media Corp, anybody you know, uh, who would like to tune in around the world can join us. Uh, International Women's Day is celebrated globally to commemorate the cultural, political, and socio-economic achievements of women. Today, we have lined up a series of intriguing sessions where women in leadership here in Singapore and also those who, you know, govern the region, from all sorts of industries, are going to be sharing valuable lessons and insights uh, on how our world is working towards positive change despite challenges that women face. We're going to touch on lessons learned and scalable good practices, as well as trends and shifts in the gender equality landscape. To kick things off, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud that we have a woman CEO here at MediaCorp. So it's my pleasure to invite her up on stage. She's Media Corp Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Tam Lok Kang, to say a few words on International Women's Day. Please warmly welcome her. Good afternoon, guest of honor, Minister Josephine Teo, distinguished um, guests, friends, and colleagues. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. And also a very warm welcome to all who are streaming in from around the world on CNA's YouTube channel. I am pleased to present the third CNA Leadership Summit. The first was on digital economy. The second last year was on a sustainable green recovery, and today, on International Women's Day, the summit focuses on women inspiring change. We have a stellar lineup today, a politician, a businesswoman, and a Nobel laureate, all from Asia. Minister Josephine Teo entered politics some 16 years ago. Since then, she has held senior positions in the ministries of finance, transport, foreign affairs, manpower, and currently home affairs, as well as the communications industry. 
Ms. Jane Sun is the Chief Executive Officer of the Trip.com Group, the largest travel company in China and Asia. Fortune magazine named Ms. Sun amongst the top 50 most powerful women in business for the last four years, while Forbes named her one of the most influential and outstanding businesswomen in China in 2017. Ms. Maria Ressa has been a journalist in Asia for more than 35 years. She co-founded Rappler, the top digital news site that is leading the fight for press freedom in the Philippines. In October 2021, Ms. Ressa was one of the two journalists awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of her efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. We also have a panel of outstanding women leaders, Ms. Sapna Chada of Google, Ms. Ritu Chandi from BMW, and Ms. Tehui Ling from RBC, who will also be sharing their perspectives with us later. Looking at these women, I'm reminded of what Michelle Obama said, that there is no limit to what we as women can accomplish. Today's summit comes during a period of heightened awareness and change for Singapore. 2021 was designated by the Ministry of Social and Family Development as the year of celebrating SG women. The celebration actually marked 60 years since the passing of the Women's Charter to safeguard women's welfare in Singapore. This, con this journey will continue in 2022. Policies and legislation must evolve in tandem with the aspirations and needs of today's women. I look forward to the proposals drawn to further women's progress based on input from nearly 6,000 Singaporeans that will be presented in a white paper later this year. MediaCorp, as the national media network, is uniquely positioned to use our creative capabilities, our editorial expertise, our platforms and our personalities to spotlight the achievements of today's women and to inspire positive change. We aspire to reflect our priorities as a responsible corporate citizen and the importance we place on gender inclusion and diversity. CNA's website now hosts CNA Women. It is dedicated to topics that impact and interest women, such as financial literacy, health, wellness. We will continue to build on this by adding digital guides for women at different life stages, including a legal and financial series, and a Women by Women Spotlight, spotlighting women entrepreneurs. We also launched, as Yasmin introduced earlier, the Double X Files on CNA 938 in August last year. The Double X Files discusses the issues and topics of interest to women, telling the stories of women who have contributed to their communities. The diverse array of, of uh, personalities we have spotlighted includes Team Singapore Paralympic swimmer Sophie Soon, Dr. Nolene Hazer, former Undersecretary General of the United Nations, and Minister Josephine Teo herself. And tonight at 9 p.m., I hope you will join us in the premiere of Standing on Her Shoulders on CNA. This four-part documentary series will delve into the remarkable lives of everyday women, and as the title suggests, it will also highlight the stories of the giants on whose shoulders these women stand on today. Raising awareness through content is core to our community engagement, but it is also just one part of a larger picture. It is the partnerships that we build that are essential in co-creating solutions that can really help to shift societal mindsets. To this end, let me once again thank all our partners, many of whom are here today, for your support in bringing today's event to fruition. I would like to conclude with another quote this time from Melinda Gates. A woman with a voice is by definition a strong woman, but the search to find that voice can be remarkably difficult. I look forward to an afternoon of insight and inspiration from the remarkable voices of all our speakers today. Thank you and please enjoy the summit. Thank you, Lo King. Ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed privileged to have with us today our guest of honor, Mrs. Josephine Teo, who is Minister for Communications and Information and Second Minister for Home Affairs. 
and she's going to be joining us for the fireside chat. Mrs. Teo, without further ado, I invite you on stage. You. Good to see you. Yes, there Thank you, you very much for having me. You're looking well. It's been um, over two years since I've seen you face to face, I think, because we're always talking on radio. Yeah, so <laughs> it's good to finally see you face to face. That's right. All right, let's start with, I guess, the story of Singapore women in the workplace. So the last census was good news mm -hmm. for Singapore women. Uh, slim educational gender gap, um, a jump in university degrees, equal access to upskilling. But when it comes to women on boards of directors of Singapore companies, women CEOs as well, except here at MediaCorp, because we've got looking, um, there seems to be better that we can do. Mrs. Teo, what's the mindset needed to change this idea in the workplace and to fill these positions at the top? Well, it's uh, really wonderful that you raise this question. And I've been uh, asked this uh, very often, particularly in my previous role as a manpower minister. And um, uh, quite often, people uh, express a desire to see equality at the workplace. Um, equality at the workplace, I think there are you know, two parts to it. One is equality of opportunity, and the other is in terms of uh, outcomes. Now, where opportunities are concerned, I would say that uh, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in Singapore, especially because of education and training being you know, very widely available, and uh, women are certainly taking good advantage of these opportunities. So we've made very good progress there. But as you correctly point out, Yasmin, in terms of outcomes, there is still a lot of room for improvement. Um, it's not uncommon these days you know, in every occupation to see women. And at the entry level, uh, there is no shortage also. Women candidates perform very well, and they are very much you know, uh, uh, tapped upon by employers. But as the years pass, and as we go further up you know, the ladder, and when you look into the C-suites, and if you look into the boardroom, the numbers are still relatively small. They can be better. Um, but one of the things that encourages me is if you talk to employers, they have a very, very strong realization that they really shouldn't be depriving themselves of the talented women already in their workforce or out there. And if we continue to grow the economy well, if opportunities continue to expand, then that is good for everyone, and I think especially for women. So if you ask me, I'm quietly hopeful that uh, in my lifetime, uh, we will be able to see, even at the highest echelons, much more equal representation of men and women. So I'm very hopeful about that. All right. What about women leading this country? Because this is your expertise right now. I mean, you're one of the leaders that we look forward to listening to every now and then. I mean, you tell us the things that are important for the nation. If people want to join politics, how difficult is it to get a woman to come and join politics? And perhaps even in your lifetime, will you see a female prime minister? That question has to be asked to the audience, correct? <laughs> you would agree? Uh, but I would say that um, uh, the challenges of public life uh, for women uh, are, are, are not um, unknown. Uh, you are, you know, apart from a very demanding work schedule, uh, you are constantly under scrutiny, and um, it's not always easy to settle these things within families. Uh, but I would say that um, in, in the current context, uh, politics is equally challenging for uh, male uh, 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 personalities. Um, for example, you know, uh, and... and a simple comment that is made you know, can be misconstrued and uh, you can attract a lot of unwanted attention online. And whether it is women or it is men, all have to deal with it. And that's the reality. 
but I would say that the situation in Singapore, thankfully, is still a lot better than elsewhere in the world. And I think, to a very large extent, it is because of the kind of public that we have, a public that is very discerning. And I say this um, you know, with all seriousness. And part of the ability of the public to discern is also because we have trusted media in Singapore that puts out stuff that is credible, that is well curated and helps people to understand the world for what it is. And if we can keep this up, then I would say that um, you know, we should always maintain a very hopeful you know, outlook to the future. Thank you for mentioning the media. I would just like your point of view on how the media can possibly drive change in equality for women. You know, the media's role is huge. Uh, so much of how we understand the world uh, is shaped by the media. Uh, for example, what is considered newsworthy and is reported? Uh, what issues get analyzed deeply and are produced into features? And whose point of view is expressed? is carried. These things are very much shaped by the media. So if the media does not care much about women, then neither will society. And what are the things that media can do in support of women's development? I think there are broadly three. One, I would say in terms of Profiling uh, positive role models, people you know, who inspire others, that's one. Secondly, I think in terms of how women are portrayed in media, that's also very important. And thirdly, I would say rallying support for women's development through events like this. This is your way of expressing to the public that this is important for our society and deserves attention. And because you are choosing to focus on it, then the rest of society will also pay attention. I like your point about role modeling, because I believe it's important. You seem to think so too. Here locally, do you feel we have enough role models in Singapore to inspire this generation and also the next one? Actually, if you look hard enough, there are so many amazing women. And they're not necessarily women you know, with um, a very big job title or you know, always being asked you know, to uh, face the public. There are a lot of amazing women quietly working behind the scenes, effective change on, effective, effecting change on the ground. And what I particularly like is when the media makes an effort to uncover these gems and then tell their stories. It's, it, 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 it balances the picture uh, a lot more. It, you, you don't have to have someone put you on a pedestal you know, in order to be a role model. There are inspiring women all around us and they are contributing, they're making a difference in very different ways. And we have to have it in us to be able to appreciate the whole range in which you know, people contribute, women in particular. So when the media makes a, an effort to uncover these stories and to help us appreciate the impact that they are making on the ground, that to me makes a huge difference. Mm. Interesting that you say that because this morning we had a chat on CNA 93 mm -hmm. where everyday women heroes in Singapore called mm -hmm. in and it was very early in the morning, and what they said was, well, if I can get up, get myself out of the door with the kids to school, get to work, do very well at the end of the day, have a cup of tea and I'm happy, then I feel like a hero. Absolutely, because, you know, we, we don't know the kind of challenges uh, individuals have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes, um, you know, I was just recently sent a... Um, uh, uh, a media story about, uh, I, I shan't mention who, but a very outstanding athlete, you know, seems to have it all. And I worry about that 
Because when an image like that is sent to other young women, it's very difficult to see how you could get anywhere near. But success cannot be defined you know, for ourselves according to what other people have achieved. And women need to have the permission to achieve, to define success in their own terms and to be recognized and honored for achieving their own aspirations, fulfilling their own potential. And it's, um, it's something that I think we have to be very conscious of. Mm. Just very quickly, still on media, what about social media and women who you know, choose to post the picture-perfect moments of their day and make it look like everything's under control, but it might have taken a thousand shots to get there? Do you think they're ruining it, ruining it for other women? I don't know. I mean, every one of us has tried, and you know, like that, like that. Yeah, and and yeah, I know. I think we all know, right? It takes many shots to get that perfect angle. So if you know that, then you know, just see it for what it is, and not uh, exert too much pressure on yourself. Having said that, I think uh, for younger women, it's not so easy to appreciate that uh, behind what is being presented. Uh, often is hard work. This is not to discount um, the abilities as well as the achievements of you know, women who have become very successful online. Not at all. But it is to say that it does come with some hard work and it doesn't mean that you know, all of us have to be like that. Um, so, so I think as slightly older women, uh, we, we can do our part to highlight uh, to younger women that um, this is not necessarily the kind of standard that you need to aspire to because it can feel very daunting and it has the possibility of making you feel small every single day. So, um, but I, I, again, I am hopeful. I see that many young women themselves recognize it and they are giving each other peer support. More of that would be helpful, I think. And um, you know, if we encourage the women to value themselves, what they are able to contribute to their own families, to their own communities. And of course, there are some women who will make their mark in their chosen fields of specialization. They can succeed in the arts. They can be very effective as media personalities. Um, they could succeed in science and engineering. And each one has something to give. And each one should have something that can be honoured. And we don't have to try to be someone else. Mrs. Teo, I think Singapore is going to be a good place for women moving forward, even better. In September 2021, Prime Minister Lee gave a preview of the white paper. We're all looking forward to it. We were told maybe March this year. What can we look forward to? And how will workplace discrimination be addressed, do you think? That's a great question. Um, well, first let me say that um, Singapore is already starting on a fairly high base in terms of women development. Uh, there have been many occasions where this has been enumerated, so I won't belabor the point. Um, but why are we then having this white paper? Why are we even making this effort? It is to say that women's development is always going to be a journey without end. You know, each time women in Singapore achieve a major milestone that should really be thought of as a foundation upon which to aim for new highs. And that's the approach that we are taking. I think it is also important to recognize that in putting together the white paper, what matters most are what our women want. What they tell us is important in their lives. It's not policy makers, you know, the team just looking at numbers, looking at analysis, and then thinking about it. That is important. But ultimately, we want to hear from the ground what's important to your day-to-day -day experience. And that's why, um, in the lead-up to the white paper, there was a, a year-long series of conversations on women's development. Thousands of women uh, enthusiastically participated. I should also say that, very interestingly, lots of men were part of the conversation too. That was, that was very refreshing. And, um, and putting on a, a different hat uh, as the a chairperson of a 
the PAP's women's wing, we also compiled a bumper crop of recommendations to submit to the government, which we are sure will be carefully considered. Now then putting on my hat uh, as a member of the cabinet, what I can share is that uh, the white paper will soon be presented and uh, there will be uh, many important recommendations. I would just outline three of them that I think are particularly responsive to what women have told us last year. The first is exactly the area that you talked about, enshrining fairness at the workplace, whether it is in terms of recruitment, advancement, or how harassment uh, is being dealt with. So fairness at the workplace is a very important plank. The second important plank, I think, is in terms of how we can enhance support for home-based caregiving. Because majority of the caregivers are still women. And this is absolutely necessary because families that have to deal with frail seniors, and this can be for very long term, they do need better support, they need more relief. So that's a second plank of the white paper that will be spoken more of. The third, I think, is something that as an advanced society, we really don't want to see much of, and that is violence against women, sexual offences, family violence. So it would be in strengthening protection for victims of sexual offences and violence and making it absolutely clear that there is no place for such things in Singapore and women really should not have to bear with it. So those would be the three areas. Akan datang. Akan coming datang. soon. Look forward to it. Thank you so much for that preview. Um, and I'm sure mental health will be mm. mentioned somewhere in there. Um, what can we do better in Singapore to uh, protect the mental health of women here? That's a really good question. Um, I, I should just say that um, worldwide, the issues with mental health have great, gained greater prominence and the incidence of mental health issues in a person's lifetime is, is not something that uh, we you know, should dismiss. Uh, I think there have been scientific studies, there has been suggestion that uh, up to one in four persons in their entire life would experience at least one episode of serious mental health issues. So that, think about that, you know. Throw a stone and hit someone one in four times, that person would have to deal with mental health issues. That's quite a lot. Now, there's another um, fact also to do with mental health, and that is women seem to be more affected than men. Higher incidence, higher proportions. Um, for us in Singapore, I think we would have to also pay attention to contemporary issues. And for us, mental health issues as a result of uh, individuals' engagements online, those are of particularly great concern. Uh, this would have to bo do with uh, potentially sexual harassment, uh, potentially to do with a non-consensual publication of images that uh, you intended you know, uh, in a, in a private exchange. And women are very often victims of it. Children are also very often victims of that. But I just want to say that it's not, it's not confined to women. Men can be affected too, but women seem to get the lion's share of this kind of targeting. And this is why about a year ago, uh, in my ministry, we started a alliance for action to deal with online harms. We call it the Sunlight Alliance. And the reason it's called Sunlight is, uh, is, is to say that there are dark corners of um, our, our internet and we want to shine a light on it. Now, what was most encouraging for me in, uh, in the Sunlight Alliance for Action was really that, um, you know, although there was strong, there was a lot of recognition that this is a, a, quite an intractable problem, not 
easy to overcome. Uh, there was a high degree of willingness to address the challenges head on. Nobody was, you know, sort of skirting around the issue, not being, you know, candid about the difficulties. And it was also great to see that people weren't just twiddling their thumbs and saying that somebody else should try and solve the problem. They were actually quite ready to get into, you know, the doing part of things. And um, so we saw, you know, participants uh, in the uh, alliance step forward and say, look, you know, minimally we can uh, organize a webinar to raise awareness about these issues. We can invite parents to join in. We can bring in legal professionals to talk about you know, how you can take action if you had been targeted. We can bring in counsellors to help um, friends and colleagues notice telltale signs. You know, so there was this huge um, um, outpouring of um, you know, effort. And that's what made me very cheered. It, it, to me, beyond... Uh, us trying to work on a very serious topic, it also signaled the maturing of our society, the willingness to go beyond talk to action. So that was a, a huge uh, a plus, you know, uh, from my perspective. Okay, lovely initiative. I like what you said uh, about how encouraged you were that many men participated mm -hmm. in the conversations leading up to the white paper. I must ask you now about what you think men can do better to bring out the best in their wives, their sisters, their daughters, their female oh my God, colleagues. That sounds like a trick question. <laughs> I, I'm not saying their mothers, because that's going to be a difficult one. You can't change okay. your mom. But <laughs> the women that, you know, mm, really need a lot of support. Um, what can men do better to help? I say that a lot of men are already doing a lot better than their, 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 the previous generation. I'll give you two examples. I was very tickled uh, by these. Um, so this was well before COVID. This was some years back already. Uh, one evening during my Meet the People session, uh, there was a woman who had dragged her, her son and the prospective daughter-in-law uh, to my Meet the People session. And um, so I you know, said, ma'am, what seems to be the problem? She says, these two? need to get married, <laughs> good. And I say, but these two cannot get HDB flat. So why is that so? And um, because they have exceeded the income ceiling for applying for a BTO flat. So I said, oh, I understand. So I wrote you know, an appeal letter for them. And but towards the end, I said to her, but ma'am, you know, if I may say so, this is a good problem. Your children are doing well. You know, we, sh we are happy for them. And she looked at me and she said, she is doing well. <laughs> and she couldn't help it, but she declared to me, she said, you know, the income ceiling, I think at that time was 12,000. So she blurted out and she said, you know, she's making this amount. And he's making this amount. And they add up to more than this 12,000. And she said, you know, what happens if they have kids and the kids need to be looked after? You know, that amount will shrink. So I was, you know, kind of observing the young couple's uh, expressions. And I, I have to say, I, I almost believe that I saw this. I kind of had you know, a sense that they too looked at each other. <laughs> and it seemed to me that they were saying to each other, well, if that really happens, then I'm going to stay home, lah. You know, that's the gentleman, lah. You know? And, and so that was one, um, uh, one very uh, funny incident. Another incident was um, a, a senior uh, uh, business leader, a gentleman, and we got around to just talking about the kids and so on. And I, I believed I, I might have attended his, his child's uh, wedding. And so, so how's the young man doing? He's very good, but you know, he's doing a lot of housework these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I, I almost said, you know, what's wrong with that? 
but I decided that maybe this gentleman is not quite ready. So I would say, uh, my own observation, and today it's not so surprising when you see young couples you know, going out, you, you, you do see dads being very involved. Um, you, you do see dads uh, appearing at preschool, you know, picking up the children. So I, I, I just want to commend all the men who uh, love their partners, love the women in their life enough to want to do something. I also I want to commend them for caring enough about us being a progressive society to be willing to chip in and, um, you know, keep it up. Keep it up, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for those stories. And if you don't mind sharing your own, mm -hmm. how do you juggle your political work, motherhood, and also personal goals? Well, uh, I'm one of those very, very, very fortunate women. Uh, uh, my husband uh, is a very enlightened person. He is very involved with the children uh, from the time that they were young. But I should say that he had a fantastic role model. That's my late father-in-law. Um, frankly speaking, when my kids uh, were unwell, the person who woke up in the middle of the night to tend to them was always my husband. He'd have a little alarm clock by his side. If the children had had medication, he would set it to two hours later to check in on them. So, you know, um, gentlemen like that really make it so much easier for us women to, to you know, feel confident about um, being active contributors to our organizations, if we were always having to be concerned about you know, our family commitments, uh, and if the burden, the load was always going to be on us, it's going to be very difficult. I should also just make a special shout out to my brothers, because they have been wonderful. I mean, it's not un unexpected, you know, when we get to a certain age, our parents have all kinds of ailments. And my brothers have been wonderful in chipping in, you know, to, to um, help with their care. And, and I should just say that I hope that mine isn't an exception, that really this is a norm in our society. And I have a lot of reason to see that it isn't, uh, uh, to believe that it is a norm. I see quite a lot of it. I see so many, you know, uh, uh, you know, male colleagues who, who are doing their bit, you know, in their families, and I encourage them. So nice, we got to hear about your brothers as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. Good um, chaps, you know. Of course, when we were little, you know, we fought a lot. All taken. All taken. <laughs> yes, mm. yes. All right. So, just some closing words, Mrs. Teo, perhaps about how women can adjust our mindset to accept equality as the norm? Mm. This is a tough one. Huh? Um, years ago, again, I remember attending this uh, grooming class. You know, when you first join the workforce, your employers are deathly worried that when you meet clients and so on, you don't know how to conduct yourself, <laughs> so they put us through grooming and deportment. And um, so... Um, there was this uh, one lady instructor, uh, a real vivacious woman, and, um, and it came to uh, how we should dress ourselves. And she was very funny. She said, she, she said to all the girls in the class, and she said, remember this, you know, if you look good, your husband looks good. <laughs> so we were all pretty amused because not that, I mean, there's no reason why we only look good for our husbands, right? We can look good for a variety of reasons for ourselves. Um, and, but, you know, if you took what she said and thought about it in a different way, uh, in essence, what she's reflecting is the fact that women's achievements are society's achievements. And so women's progress equals society's progress. And if we could just keep that thought in our mind that, you know, for us, for women doing well, it's not just for ourselves. It is also for the men in our lives. It's for our dads. It's for our partners, our husbands. It's for um, our brothers, our sons. 
And this morning I was greatly cheered um, because it's International Women's Day, people are sending greetings to each other. And there's one that seems quite apt for the topic that you just asked. And the quote says that there is no hero without her. There is no hero without her. And that perhaps sums it all up for our conversation. Beautiful way to end. Thank you so much for that <laughs> quote. It's something you don't forget very easily. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Josephine Teo, our guest of honor today, Minister for Communications and Information and Second Minister for Home Affairs. Thank, thank you, you for your time, Mrs. Thank Teo. You, Lovely seeing yeah. you. And thank you for being here today. that very insightful conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everyone is having a good time. Yes? My name is Julie Yu. I present CNA's flagship morning show, Asia First, and it's my great pleasure to be part of this very important event on a significant day for women in Singapore, Asia, and around the world. On this day, there's lots to celebrate for women, especially in business. More girls are going to school, more women are starting and owning their own businesses, growing their careers and leading companies around the world. And initiatives are being introduced to achieve gender balance in a corporate world. But when it comes to women in the boardroom, they're still astonishingly underrepresented, accounting for only about 20% of board seats and about 5% of CEO positions globally. And at this current rate, a report by Deloitte says that it would take another 20 years or so to reach gender parity in the boardroom. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are shining examples of many women taking leadership roles across the region, driving positive change, and continuing to uplift and empower future generations of women to come. At the forefront of that effort is Miss Jane Sun, the CEO of Chinese online travel giant Trip.com Group, one of the largest online travel agencies in the world with 400 million users. Ms. Sun first joined the company, then known as C-Trip, as a CFO in 2005, rose to become COO in 2012, co-president in 2015, before taking on the role as CEO in 2016. Throughout the course of her career, Ms. Sun has been recognized many times over as one of the world's powerful, influential, and creative women in business. Her efforts to improve the standing of female employees within the company have also garnered wide recognition. We are deeply honored, and personally, as a working woman, I'm very excited to be speaking to Ms. Sun and to get a chance to hear about her insights, her experiences, and her vision of a more gender-equal world. There'll be a Q&A session at the end of the fireside chat, so I'd like to encourage our audience to share your questions if you have anything for Ms. Sun. By using the pigeon hole, uh, you can find a QR code on your tables. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Jane Sun with a warm round of applause. <laughs> Ms. Jane Sun, thank you so much for joining us. It would have been great if you're here in person, but still lovely to see you. Hope you're well. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming to Singapore. It's my favorite place to visit. <laughs> good to know, good to know. Let's get straight into it. I want to start with your personal journey to the boardroom. Uh, recently um, came across a very interesting survey done by Harvard Business Review, which found that 57 female CEOs. Of these, five had said they always wanted to be CEO. Three said they didn't want the role, but they took it out of sense of responsibility. Two-thirds said that they didn't know they could be CEO until someone else told them. How was it for you? Was it always your plan to become a leader? 
When I first joined the company, I was the first female CFO in the China market,、uh, and gradually I took on more and more responsibility and become the COO and then president and then CEO of the company. My growth trajectory really is blessed for many people who supported me.、Uh, so in return, I also want to be very supportive to mentor、uh, many female leaders to become CEO later on. We'll talk more about that later、uh, on our conversation. But you said in one of your previous interviews that your career is a reflection of China's 40 years of development opening up. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I think females、uh, have tremendous talents,、uh, but depending on different age,、uh, they have experienced、uh, different opportunities.、Uh, for example, my grandmother was very smart. But for her generation,、uh, she was just like one of many other women.、Uh, was told to stay at home without being able to go to school, and her age、uh, during her age,、uh, China was、uh, going through the Second World War. And my mother again was very smart. She was a chemistry engineer, but the country、uh, was not opening up、uh, until my generation. I joined the first generation of the students、uh, to go to the USA to study. So I always feel very blessed、uh, for the opportunity, and I want to make sure much is given, much is expected. So now I become the executive of our company.、Uh, we have adopted many female-friendly、uh, policies to encourage the more females to become、uh, the executives to lead our company forward. Come a long way, but it wasn't a smooth sailing.、Uh, I hear that when you went to Japan for the first time as CFO,、uh, accompanying your、uh, chairman and your counterparts bowed and introduced themselves. But then they didn't even bother to come shake your hand, assuming that you were just an assistant. I mean, could you recall any of the biases or assumptions made about you just because you're a woman? And how did you deal with them? Yes,、uh, invisibly there are many biases、uh, in Asian countries. Still, very few people can imagine that a female can take such an important role twenty years ago, and even in the Silicon Valley. Uh, when I joined a group of CEOs to visit、uh, the CEOs in Silicon Valley,、uh, a lot of people asked me, "Where was your husband?" So they assume I went on the CEO trip because my husband、uh, was the CEO of the company, and it just happened、uh, my husband John was not there.、Uh, so it's very difficult for、uh, many people still to imagine that a female can take such an important leadership role. Uh, to lead lead the company forward. Speaking of dealing with pressure and challenges, the COVID nineteen pandemic has certainly proven to be a revealing test of leadership. And we've seen many articles and commentaries saying that women are better leaders when it comes to times of crisis, times of uncertainty.、Uh, how would you describe the approach of women leaders、um, in dealing with extreme challenges? Mm. I think a male and a female brings different strengths.、Uh, females are very good with putting themselves in other people's shoes. Very good with、uh, communication.、Uh, very good with、uh, team building, and are very willing to make personal sacrifice for the best interest of the team.、Uh, so during COVID, we made our policy that customer first, partner second, trip dot com the third. So by telling our customer they are the first,、uh, I remember when COVID hit,、uh, many of the Chinese、uh, customers are waiting、uh, to take their vacation abroad.、Uh, so instantly, we need to respond to the closure of the borders by returning and refunding our customers for thirty-six billion instantly.、Uh, it was a lot of pressure, yet our team united、uh, as one person and made a decision very quickly. Uh, talk with the bank, get the money ready,、uh, get the fund ready, return the、uh, refund to the customers. That's a demonstration to put our customer in the first place. The second thing is we saw many small and medium-sized、uh, business travelers or travel tourism board were under lots of pressure. So we established a one billion partnership fund to help them with cash flow. We also worked with banks to establish a ten billion. Uh, loans make it available 
for our small and medium-sized partners to help them through this very challenging time. The third one is Trip.com, the third, because our revenue was reducing uh, very quickly due to the pandemic. Uh, our chairman and I volunteer uh, to our board that we will take zero salary until industry recovers. And our VP volunteered to our board that they will take 50% pay cut. And then our, our uh, staffs uh, told our team members that they will work four days and stay at home for one day. Some of them will work three days and stay at home for two days. By doing that, we're able to retain the talents during the very challenging time and make sure uh, we make all the infrastructure investment to be ready when the board opens, when the pent-up demand is back again. And I understand that China's domestic travel is picking up, um, but given Chinese government is still pursuing a zero policy, a zero COVID policy, that is, how is recovery looking for Trip.com and what's the biggest threats that your company is facing right now? Mm. Yeah, the positive thing is that the data from the world has shown that the death rate uh, from COVID is reducing. And second thing is the vaccination rate is increasing. Uh, as people are taking two shots or sometimes three shots, more and more people are well protected. So we are confident with the development in the medical field and with more data being accumulated, eventually we will be able to overcome the difficulty and make sure that the travel demand will be addressed appropriately. When do you think Chinese tourists can travel overseas again? Yeah, right now the domestic travel uh, is picking up. And also in the rest of the world, we have seen a very nice pickup uh, for domestic travel uh, for each country. However, as you can see, the cross-border transactions is still under lots of pressure because uh, we have different rules and regulations and control procedures uh, when we cross borders. So Trip.com is very much uh, technology savvy. Uh, so we want to make sure that all the information is provided to our travelers online through their APPs, uh, through their mobile devices. So when our customer cross the borders, uh, they will be very well protected. Ms. San, I'll bring you back to your personal experience again. Uh, on top of the pressure of leading the company, you're also a mother, you're also a wife, a daughter, daughter-in-law. Let's not leave that out. Um, through the course of a career, what sort of personal sacrifices have you made? And do you think based on your experience, can high achieving women have it all? Yes, I don't think it's a sacrifice. I think uh, I always tell our team that being a working mother, we have to be prepared that we need to invest twice as much efforts as a person who just choose to do one set of the work. Uh, but the good thing is the rewarding, uh, the rewards is also twice as much. Uh, so being a full-time mother, being a full-time wife can be a full-time job already. And being a full-time CEO is more than 40 hours uh, <laughs> per week. But uh, the good thing is when we look at the rewards, not only we achieve success in our family, but we also achieve success uh, in our career. So it's a, a job that is very challenging, yet very rewarding. I want to transition now to enabling women in the workplace. I'm sure you have lots to say about that. You know, it's well known that the companies with greater gender diversity among senior leadership, they perform better. But what's unclear is why that is. When I look at your company, women make up over half of Trip.com's 40,000 employees, one third of the upper management, more than 40% of the middle management. Tell us why having more female executives is so closely related with better business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, travel uh, is very much uh, driven by both male and female. And it's one of the industry uh, which were taking more than 55% uh, of the females as its workforce. Uh, so as a company, uh, we have taken down a lot of measures and implemented lots of policies which support our female workers. For example, when a female is pregnant, we will offer free taxi to take them to work 
and bring them home. When they are uh, when they return to work, we offer flexible working hours. When the baby is born, we give them uh, 800 as welcome gift, 3,000 as education fee. And now we realize more and more females are getting their PhDs and wanted to study overseas because, uh, before they return to work. So if you calculate uh, the years when they can graduate after they graduate from school, it probably is already 26 to 28 years old after they get their PhD to 35, which is a critical age when doctor will classify you as a high risk pregnancy. So during this seven to eight years, uh, it's the golden year uh, for them to develop their career. And it's also a golden year for them to give birth to their babies. So we think about how we can support our females better. And one of the ways is to fully utilize our technology. So if our female workers are decided to have their eggs frozen, we will pay for it. And Trip.com is the first company and only company in China market to support our, our female leaders uh, for this uh, progressive policy. That's a progressive policy indeed, and a very bold one too. I, I wonder uh, what's been the take up? Have a lot of the uh, women managers in your company uh, have taken advantage of the policy? Yes, very much so. Uh, when we recruit students from uh, college, when we recruit uh, talents from the market, this becomes a very important uh, policy. Uh, many female talents join us because of uh, uh, this uh, friendly, female friendly policy. Uh, since you mentioned technology earlier, I want to zoom out a little bit uh, and talk about tech scene in China. How much has changed for women in technology um, now compared to when you started out in this field? Mm. When I first uh, came to China market, I was the only female CFO in the whole market. Uh, and now more and more uh, females are joining high tech company uh, to become executives in this field. So I'm very encouraged to see the progress uh, in this field. Yet many uh, has been done, many yet to be done. So as an uh, executive in a high tech company, I always feel tremendous responsibility to implement and encourage our uh, females uh, to become braver, to take on more responsibility when they develop their career. And son, and studies have shown that women have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Many have to not only deal with work, but also juggle with caregiving demands. They're starting to question their career prospects as well. What can companies do to mitigate um, the sort of negative effects from the pandemic, especially, and ensure women stay longer in organizations, long term, I mean? Mm. Yeah, as one of the measures we have taken recently is promoting uh, a flexible uh, working uh, format. It's a hybrid working model. We ask employee to adopt three plus two, uh, meaning three days in office, two days uh, working at home. And we did our A-B testing for the past six months by testing more than uh, 1,500 employees. The productivity uh, was not impacted. However, we're able to reduce the attrition rate from 7.9% to 4.5%. And also the job satisfaction from our workforce has significantly increased. And by allowing our employees to work two days in the office, they're able to reduce the commute times and for working mothers and working fathers, uh, this is very helpful uh, because they are able to uh, use the time they saved in spending with their children. Uh, that's why we feel it's a very good policy and it's very carbon uh, friendly as well. It certainly is. And speaking of family, your husband, John Wu, who is an ex Alibaba CTO turned investor, is no chump when it comes to work. I wonder how much he supports on the home front and as uh, a leading couple, a super couple. Um, how do you successfully balance work and home life? Is there a Thank secret you. or a ground rules? Thank you. Uh, John is very supportive. Uh, we have two 
uh, young daughters. And both of us believe female uh, should be very independent and the mothers uh, will become the best role models uh, for their children. Uh, so uh, he and I try to share works and uh, I go to work very early in the morning, uh, between six to seven o'clock. I'm already in office getting my things done. Starting from eight o'clock, I have meeting plan out back to back. And if I'm not traveling, I try to spend, uh, uh, take my work uh, at six to seven o'clock in the evening. And I try to spend at least a couple of hours in the evening uh, with my family. Uh, when my children is young, uh, I help them with uh, their homework. Uh, but uh, in, when they go to uh, bed, uh, we will start our overseas meeting late in the evening, like nine o'clock, NASDAQ opens, uh, Europe still is in session. So uh, we have a quite uh, late evening session with our overseas partners. Uh, that's how we balance our work and life. But uh, yeah, John is uh, very supportive uh, for a female to be very independent and uh, balance work and life. Well, my husband is listening. Uh, and all right, when we talk about issue of women on boards, you know, many people say we just cannot find enough capable, qualified women to fill those positions. What do you think is the root cause of that? And what can we do to you know, develop a sustainable pipeline of competent female candidates? If we look at the college, uh, actually female students get better grades. Uh, more than 50% of the top students are females. And when we uh, enter, when the students enter into workforce, uh, pretty much they are quite equal as well. It's when the female and the male accelerating in their career paths, they need more help. Uh, for example, I remember one time uh, we had an offsite meeting and uh, one of my director reports just had a baby and I know she was breastfeeding her baby. So I offered that she can take her baby with her uh, and during the meeting break, she can go to her room and breastfeed her baby. And I just didn't do too much. I just thought because I used to be a mother who uh, breastfed my baby, I understand what it takes. It's a very simple uh, offer, uh, yet it helped her so much because very few uh, employees will have the courage to go to their CEO and ask if they can bring their baby with her during the offsite meeting. Uh, and so I think it's very important for us to have a voice to represent uh, these working mothers at uh, sea level, at the board level. Uh, so the more uh, we can uh, give support to our uh, employee uh, at the ground level and later on at the middle manager level, at senior le leverage level, we'll be able to grow them into a board member's position eventually. Ms. Sun, um, now I'd like to turn some of the questions from the audience. Uh, I'm getting some questions. A member of the audience is asking, Based on your observations, what are the three major mistakes that women make in the workplace? Mm. I think it's not mistakes, but uh, I would encourage our female friends uh, to push yourself out of the comfort zone. Uh, many times I see uh, my director reports, male and female, both work very hard. However, during year end, uh, people who come to my office ask for promotion, ask for salary increases are mostly males. And a lot of time I have to ask the female leaders to come to my office and personally encourage them to go through the uh, promotion committee. And a lot of them will tell me, oh, Jane, Trip.com have given me tremendous opportunity, but I think I still need to, you know, wait two more years uh, to be promoted to the next level. And as a working mother, I totally understand how much uh, they're taking on because not only they need to take care of work, but they also need to take care of their family. However, I think if you have done a tremendous job, uh, you deserve a promotion. So I would really encourage our female um, friends to push yourself out of comfort zone. The second thing is being very optimistic uh, because uh, in any business, 
uh, in any family, there is always ups and downs. Uh, the past two years for any companies, any countries, any families, uh, we have been through quite a lot. So keep up with this uh, optimistic uh, view is very important. The third one is uh, being very curious because the world is moving very fast. A lot of things we learn from college are no longer applicable. Uh, so keep up with the learning spirit. Uh, always have a very curious, curious heart uh, will make us to be a good learner and move along with our uh, generation. Jane, another question that I have for you here is, could you name a woman who has inspired you the most and why? I uh, really admire uh, Mother Teresa uh, because uh, he looks very tiny, yet the power and the love he, she has uh, brought to our world is tremendous. Uh, soldiers will stop fighting because she was there. Uh, and the leadership is in many forms. I may not be a leader uh, as a president, but a leader in a charity work, a leader in your family, a leader in your community uh, can be very powerful as well. And another one is, what leadership lessons have you learned that were unique to being a female leader? Uh, being very confident and assertive. Uh, because uh, we have lots of traits, good traits. As we said, we have strong empathy, uh, very good with putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Uh, these are all very good traits. But once we know this is the right decision, I think we always need to be uh, as confident as our male counterpart. Ramisan, now looking ahead, um, what do you think are likely to be the biggest challenge or barriers for future generations of female leaders? And what are some of the ways to overcome them? I think the world is moving towards a more positive uh, way. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, uh, my grandmother didn't even go to school. Uh, my mother didn't even have a chance to study over overseas. Uh, I was the first generation who were able to join the other 3,000 students uh, to go to the States to study. And now, you know, borders are open for a lot of students. So taking advantage of this great opportunity uh, and learn as much as possible. And there will be new challenges for new generation. As we have seen, there is war in Europe. There's COVID uh, in uh, sweeping the global places. However, as long as we maintain a very optimistic view, uh, understanding that uh, we will be able to uh, overcome these difficulty as long as we remain uh, to be uh, hardworking, uh, remain to be very optimistic, it will help us through during the very difficult time. My son, there are a lot of men in our audience too. I wonder how men, especially those in privileged positions, become better allies for gender equality uh, in the workplace? Yes, uh, men uh, are very supportive. Uh, more and more male leaders are very supportive uh, for females. And many times when I talk with them, it's not because they don't support women. They just didn't have the same experience. For example, uh, the breastfeeding uh, female I was talking about. If I told a, female, a male leader that, oh, we need to uh, ask her to bring the baby with us, nobody will say no because they want to be as supportive as possible. It's just they personally didn't have this kind of experience. So I would uh, really encourage uh, more females to have good communication with our male leaders and win their support. And I also would love to invite more and more male leaders uh, to become part of us uh, in our community to understand and give your support to this wonderful uh, population. Uh, my belief is that when you help a boy, you help one person. When you help a girl, you help the whole family, the whole village, and the whole community and the whole nation. So speaking of the future, when you look at the lessons that you learned from the past challenges throughout the course of your career and also especially pandemic, uh, how are you planning to position Trip.com uh, for the future? Mm. Trip.com right now has 400 million users. Uh, they are uh, all over the world. 
So for us,、uh, there are four elements that is very important. Of、uh, the first one is our investment in technology, particularly at、uh, the age after we finish、uh, the pandemic,、uh, technology will become very important. The second one is our investment into product. Uh, the product that covers the global travel industry will become really valuable、uh, when our customers are ready to travel. The third one is the service level.、Uh, during the COVID, any at any given time, twenty four hours times seven, any customers can reach us、uh, by calling us, and we need to respond to our customers with within twenty seconds. Uh, so the service level is very important.、Uh, the fourth one is the branding.、Uh, I think、uh, having a good brand, which、uh, will give confidence to our customers、uh, when they、uh, travel around. And the last one is also having a very good、uh, pricing structure.、Uh, so high end customers will be able to find very good, high quality product. Young students can go around the world using、uh, very economic packages.、Uh, so these elements, five elements, are the focus、uh, when we develop our business model. What role will women leaders play in that vision? Uh, very important、uh, because、uh, lots of when we study our customer portfolio,、uh, the majority of the family trips are booked、uh, by females. So to understand our female、uh, customers become very important. When we look at our partnership in the pipeline, more than fifty five percent of the jobs in the travel industries are taken by females. So、uh, to encourage them to step up. And making sure they innovate their product, develop、uh, the service technology、uh, to serve、uh, our customers well, will become a very important successful factor going forward. Miss Lam, before we let you go, where will be your first long haul destination when COVID nineteen is over? Oh, I'm ready to travel everywhere,、uh, Antarctica, as far as I can go. Antarctica. Wow. Okay. Wonderful. Hopefully, but we can welcome you to Singapore sometime very soon. Miss Sun, thank you very much for your time, for sharing your insight and your your experience and your vision with us.、Uh, and I'm sure、uh, it will encourage a lot of、uh, women out there、um, to act on their leadership potential and motivate more corporate leaders to do more to support women in all their endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give Miss Jane Sun a big round of applause? Thank you. thank you, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, again for being here. And hope you can enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to Miss Jane Sun from Trip.com. Excuse me while I remove my mask. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this event, CNA Leadership Summit 2022. Happy International Women's Day. My name is Dawn Tan. I co-present Asia tonight and Singapore tonight. They are two of CNA's flagship bulletins that you may have seen. They're on every night. Also, Money Mind. That's on once a week. It's a personal finance program. I'm the host of that show. Now, for this session, I am very pleased. To have with us Ms. Maria Ressa, Joint Nobel Peace Prize Laureate, for our next fireside chat. Maria is dialing in all the way from the Philippines, and we are so honoured to be able to have her here with us today. If you want to post a question to Maria at all, you can do so. Again, it's on the Pigeonhole website that you may have downloaded: www.pigeonhole.at. The password again, just a quick reminder: CNA eight M A R. And we will try our best to get to your questions should you have them. Now, Maria, she is well known to us all. The co-founder of Rappler.com. She is the CEO. She is the executive editor of this new site, based in the Philippines. We're fortunate she's here, and that we have this opportunity to talk to Maria. She is an inspiration to so many women, yours truly included. 
A journalist for 35 years, she has a wealth of experience behind her, well qualified to speak on things to do with journalism and to do with uh, the triumphs as well as the tribulations she has faced on that journey. She's had her fair share of both of those. But challenge is what you face, I think, when you're doing journalism right. And so Maria has a great position being able to tell us something about that journey. She was one of Time's Persons of the Year for 2018, Time's 100 Most Influential People for 2019. She has been honored around the world for her courageous work, the work we know well, fighting disinformation, fake news, attempts to silence the free press. Now, do we have Maria? There she is. Maria, let's all give her a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Maria, thank you so much for joining us here today. It is an absolute pleasure to see you in your space, that space that's become so well known to so many of us around the world. Now, Maria, as we celebrate International Women's Day, there is an exodus of women, of children, of the elderly, most of them women and children, may I add. They're leaving their homes, they're leaving their land, they're leaving their democracy behind. President Vladimir Putin has, in recent days, criminalized the process of independent journalism in Russia. He's criminalized the use of the, of the term war. Now, your fellow Nobel laureate, and you will know this, Maria, Dmitry Muratov, has stopped his newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, from reporting on this invasion, this attack, this war, as a war, for fear of repercussions. Now, you've said that you believe Russia is attempting to destroy the truth. What is your message today to the world, Maria, as we witness the silencing of Russia's independent media? Well, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. And Don, I mean, I so wish I could be in Singapore with you in that room. Um, Oh uh, my gosh, let me let let me first phrase in terms of the big picture, you know, how this moment is incredibly critical for the entire world, not just for journalists, right? You're only we're only talking about the information that you get, but essentially this moment, the first land, the first invasion that's happened really for decades, right? I mean, since World War II, I suppose, but although you have Georgia in between. Um, this is going to reinvent geopolitical power. Right now, as we speak, countries are aligning, realigning, companies are realigning, companies are taking position. We have not seen the world act with this unity and speed in many ways um, in a very, very long time. And in many ways, it is actually, I hate to say this, but you know, please keep in mind, I am ultimately an optimist in everything. And when I accepted the, no, when, when I was doing the Nobel lecture, I actually said that it, it's like an atom bomb has exploded in our information ecosystem because that is what we are facing. The corruption of facts, the corruption of truth, the, the breaking of our shared space through social media. Well, what this has happened, what ha this has done, what Putin has done is to force a confrontation. It's a confrontation the world doesn't want and a confrontation that could lead to some horrific uh, ends if we all don't handle it carefully, gingerly, empathetically, right? But what it will do is define exactly what our information ecosystem is going to begin to look like. So for example, take a look at what the technology platforms are doing to Russian disinformation. Take a look at how people have used social media for good. That's been a long time coming, right? And for the first time in a long time, the master at social media information operations or information warfare, Russia, has actually been pushed to a back 
like they, they're on a defensive right now. Um, Putin forced to actually ban uh, Meta or Facebook, right? So I think this is the the short answer is these moments, these next few weeks, these hopefully not months, but the the very painful time we are living through is going to determine what our world is going to look like. That's one. Two, of course, the journalists, Dmitry Muratov uh, and other Russian journalists, including the foreign press, many of whom have pulled out of Russia into safer spaces and will continue to report from, from these safer spaces. You know, this is also going to define new lines. Um, no country has been such a pariah as Russia is becoming now, but the world will also feel that in terms of its economic impact, the price of oil already going up to hundred, more than $139 per barrel, right? So these are things that we have to deal with, but Dmitry made a choice, you know, and it was a choice that was necessary if he wanted to keep operating in Russia. Um, others chose to leave, others chose to shut down. These are the kinds of choices increasingly journalists around the world are being forced to make. When we run into the different choices that we have to make, uh, Maria, it is often difficult, and history has, has shown us that there will be that, that pathway, those hits and those misses. Historically, democracy has been good for women, and th that's what we're celebrating today, International Women's Day. But we do run into some serious issues when we begin to look at how information is used. And that's something that you know a great deal about, Maria, how autocracies perhaps use information to, to shape and to mold our reality. And let's face it, it happens to us even in democracies. We want to establish and, and sort of uh, you know, connect our narratives so that they mean they may make sense to us every day, who's winning, who's losing, and so on. So disinformation in the hands of the powerful has devastating effects, Maria. What's the risk for democracy in 2022? We're seeing the breakdown of democracies all around the world. And, you know, I became a journalist because I believe that information is power, and it really is. And that information ecosystem is the foundation of everything in our societies, right? So if you just follow that, we agree on the facts, that becomes our shared reality. And then we negotiate within that shared reality to create things, whether, you know, and to, to find solutions to problems, whether it is uh, climate change or how to deal with coronavirus, we must agree on the facts. The biggest problem we have today is that the information ecosystem, the gatekeepers have changed. And I'll peg it back to 2014 as the kind of the year where we saw it change, right? When traditional news organizations like Channel News Asia, like, well, Rappler was born on the internet, but you know, we're, we have the kind of same standards and ethics. Um, 2014, the invasion of Crimea, annexation, let me use the right word. <laughs> so when Russia moved into Crimea was really the first time where we saw this kind of methodology that has attacked every democracy, every country around the world, every country, every user around the world that uses these giant American and Chinese social media platforms, right? So if you think about it like this, these bottom-up exponential attacks or lies uh, and then it's made, it comes top down. So your meta narrative is seeded years earlier. Even if it's a lie, you say it a million times, it becomes a fact. This is part of what it's, it's in the age of information abundance. We never expected that this could be the case, right? So you say it a million times, people begin to believe it. And then if authority comes top down, then it becomes reality. And this we saw in Crimea uh, in 2014, in May of 2014, one of the like the, the most famous information operations, a fake account on Facebook pretending to be a doctor, posts that were, and it was both Facebook and Twitter, posts that were translated in, into multiple languages claiming that Jews in Odessa, that Nazis were coming after them, and that, you know, this was uh, this essentially what Putin said eight years later when he invaded the Ukraine. Um, so it was pumped out. People began to 
to take it. And it was still relatively new in 2014. You know, you kind of, do you believe it or not? But then here's the kicker. Um, the next day, exactly a day later, the same exact message is comes out of the mouth of, of Russia's foreign minister, uh, Minister Lavrov at the United Nations. So I pegged that as a point when we saw mul- dual realities, multiple realities impact geopolitical power play. And we've seen that in every country around the world. Singapore is part of uh, a group that is of ministers who are working on on disinformation, on how to deal with this, what kind of legislation is necessary. Singapore has put in place, may not be the best one, but the point here is that disinformation is now a weapon of war. Information operations. Again, I'm going to quote a Russian former head of the KGB. His name is Yuri Andropov. He said, And this name, disinformation, came from disinformatia. He said, disinformatia is like cocaine. You take it once or twice, and you're you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you become an addict, a changed person. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but essentially, we have been living like cocaine addicts. If you take Andropov's, we live in an information ecosystem where... uh, lies spread like viruses. And the system itself actually is designed to spread lies laced with anger and hate faster and further than facts. Um, That's social media today. And that is part of the critical problem we need to deal with. I'm sorry, I haven't really answered your question because I think this is very fundamental. But to answer your question, here's what happened. In a situation like that, who were the first people attacked and who were the most vulnerable? So journalists around the world are attacked. But women in the Philippines, for example, you know, uh, my government filed uh, 10 arrest warrants in less than two years against me. This is my 36th year as a journalist. So I'm old. I have gray hair, you know, um, but shocking, still shocking, right? Because I'm just doing my job. Um And what we saw in the Philippines is that women are attacked online at least 10 times more than men. So online, you have women, any group that is already vulnerable, the LGBTQ, they are attacked more online and need, and in many ways, we've taken many steps backwards from where we used to be before social media, before technology became the gatekeepers into our information ecosystem. Maria, that flurry of mis- and disinformation that you speak about and and the the repercussions of that on women and, and on communities in general, what happens, though, when the currency of lies becomes equal to truth? Because the assumption is, well, we all want the truth, don't we? Not everybody wants the truth. What do we do? How do we fix that? So think about it like this. I'll start with the design, right? And how it's, we have gotten to a place that we could never have fathomed in the age of scarcity of information, right? In the age of scarcity of information, when when news groups were the gatekeepers, it was, you know, the idea was that the more information, the better. That's no longer the case, right? What happened when it became information abundance is that the psyche, our psychology, our minds were the ones that were targeted. And when it came to a point where a lie told a million times becomes a fact, that actually is true. Research has shown that all around the world. And as early as 2018, an MIT study did show that lies spread faster than facts. So you can actually say that by design, these platforms that now deliver the news, you know, please make no mistake, Facebook is the world's largest delivery platform for news, right? But they're biased against facts and they're biased against journalists. Why do I say that? Because the end goal of all of these platforms is to keep you scrolling on the platform. Right. So how do they do that? By serving you using algorithms to serve you content that will keep you, the new word, engaged. Except what that does is just to serve you 
a lie laced with anger and hate that will keep you angry and spreading that anger and hate. This is part of the kind of emergent human behavior that is happening. Let me just simplify it like this. An idea of polarization of society, right? Singapore government notes this in particular, that if you have a very diverse society, you want to make sure that you keep them, that you unite, right? Well, in this one, something very simple, an algorithm. So let's, you know, what is an algorithm? It's opinion in code. Opinion that can be served by a machine multiple times, millions of times. So something as simple as how do we grow our social media networks? The algorithm, Facebook, and every social media platform use this friends of friends. So if you are in the Philippines in 2016, and you can, you can substitute the United States, you can substitute any country where a polarizing leader has been elected democratically. If you're in the Philippines in 2016, that was when President Duterte was elected, he used an us against them kind of leadership, right? Demonizing another side. So here we were in 2016, we didn't debate the facts, but using the friends of friends algorithm to grow your networks, you saw this is what happened. If you're pro-Duterte, you moved further right. If you're anti-Duterte, you moved further left. That's 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. That's what algorithms do, right? Uh, and then there's also, if you look at the research on YouTube, for example, the the, the push towards more radicalism, extremism. This is built into the design of the platforms. So that growth becomes exponential. It grows in and of itself. Uh, you, you speak about President Duterte, and I want to mention him because, you know, when I think about the Philippines, I think about its long history of uh, colonialism. I think about the hundreds of years that it had before that, 300, over 300 years of it. But it does mean that the Philippines has a relatively young democracy, and, and, a, and an important one to protect. So you've got these young, energized people. You've got an election process that's going on. You also have a presidential front runner who, during this uh, Ukraine invasion, has said he didn't feel that he needed to take a stand. Now, this is at the point of which he knows he's a front runner. He may well win. We don't know. But he says, I don't need to take a stand. We're not involved in this war. I don't think there's anybody who hasn't felt that they needed to take some kind of position on, on, on this Russian invasion. But do you believe that the people of Southeast Asia should care about what we're seeing play out in the headlines, this invasion, and, and arguably, you know, for what was a healthy democracy? Ukraine was a healthy democracy. They, they voted for their leaders. And, of course, the first war on European soil in, that we've seen in decades Yeah. Um, so first, I think that um, the front runner in our presidential elections on May 9th, this is Ferdinand Marcos Jr., actually changed his position just at the end of last week. I think over the weekend, he then, he then said that uh, he condemned the invasion of Ukraine along with the Philippine government. Um, look, Here's a great saying about the Philippines. You mentioned our history. Um, the joke is that, you know, the Philippines spent 300 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood. 300 years colonized by Spain. And then we were, uh, the, the United States came in. We were a protectorate, a colony of the United States for 50 years. Um, so let me pull it back to this, right? This information and then our presidential campaign. What we have seen is that uh, our history can be changed in front of our eyes. Um, in plain view, disinformation networks, uh, they're called information operations when power uses it to change the way people think. You know, I've, I've long said now that social media has become a behavior modification system because of these algorithms that allow you to micro-target groups, not just in the Philippines, but everywhere around the world. Imagine micro-targeting um, specific messages that no one else sees. So what's been going on since 2014 is really kind of a, 
a whitewashing of our history. Remember, in 1986, the People Power Revolt ousted Ferdinand Marcos, the father of our front runner, and uh, it, it sparked all these pro-democracy movements all around the world. And here we are, 36 years later, and Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is a front runner, right? And part of the reason that has happened is because we've seen two things: um, networks of disinformation that slowly chipped away. Uh, and it went hand in hand, a perfect storm with the lack of our history books. You know, people looked away. So now we believe that Marcos, the father, was actually a hero. He has, by decree of President Duterte, been buried in the hero's cemetery. Um, and people don't know what history is. That's shocking. It's similar, again, to what Putin had tried to do in justifying the invasion of Ukraine. If you watched his long rambling justification and speeches, these are the same kinds of narratives that were seeded on social media, on Twitter, by both bots and then kind of, you know, the, the GRU and the IRA. These are from 2016 down. I think here in the Philippines, what's fascinating now, and, you know, of course, I'm in the middle of, of all of this, and I use the word fascinating because I feel like we are at this existential moment where we will determine not just our future, but our past. And the biggest question that you have to have for every country with elections this year, when there are still no guardrails around these godlike technologies, where the profit motive of these social media, these American companies, are actually driving distribution of news are driving our realities. So without that, how can you have integrity of elections? It's a question I asked in the Nobel lecture. You can't have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. That's where our shared reality begins to fall apart. And, you know, I, I'll say again, uh, the Philippines will have elections May 9th. Shortly after that, you have elections in, in countries like Hungary, you have Kenya, countries where, you know, democracy is as highly contested. Um, Brazil, Bolsonaro comes up again uh, in October, I believe. And then, of course, you have the U.S. elections. So this is a critical year for the vote. But the question I always ask now is, how free are we? You know, have the social media platforms gotten to a point where they really are a behavior modification system. And we now have to demand that the use of our data pulled together by machine learning not be used to insidiously manipulate us. And Maria, you have spoken about that. You've spoken about the need for us to, to have more of that data. We need to have access to that. And specifically for journalists, as an example, to have fuller access to that data. You, sp you speak about the guardrails, perhaps, that might be needed. What would those guardrails look like for you? It's a great question, Don. I mean, and, and you know, I've testified in many of the countries that are, that are rolling out legislation. In particular, the, uh, the European Parliament this month will be rolling out uh, we'll be voting on the Digital Services Act, which is part of its democracy action plan. Um, the UK has its online safety bill. And the US has long been debating um, this kind of Section 230. Uh, it's a part of its Communications Decency Act that allows tech platforms to actually spread lies. You know, they're not responsible for the content that is spread on their site. It's kind of like a in it's like a license to print money at the expense of the harms on the people on these platforms. And, you know, make no mistake, you're talking about unprecedented numbers globally on platforms connected to each other. We've never had this before. You know, almost three billion just on Meta's accounts on it, um, if you combine Facebook and WhatsApp. All right. So so what are we looking at? Um, you know, sorry, please, can you tell me, ask me the question again? So, of course, I'm like sitting here. The guardrails, through, the guardrails, but, Maria. We need, the guardrails. We, yes, need, yes, yes. we want to be able to have that access to data. Uh, what more can we do, though? Because that's always been the question. Is the onus on the big tech companies 
to be, to be pressed by, by laws, to, to have to obey new laws that actually will protect us finally, because we didn't have any protection when this whole experiment called the internet came to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, let me put it this way. Um, the adverti- If you think about all of these platforms now, they've become advertising companies. That is how they make most of their their revenues, a, a system called surveillance capitalism, a, a huge book by uh, Harvard professor emeritus Shoshana Zuboff. Um, so what happens is all of us are down here looking at content. That's where we wind up debating it. And most of the early legislation, I think including Singapore's, is looking at content. But that's the wrong place to look. It's not the content that you want to actually regulate because then you step on, you could be stepping on free speech issues. You want to move further upstream. And this is where you have the algorithms of distribution. This isn't a free speech issue as much as a it is a distribution issue, right? What actually is coded in those algorithms of distribution? What bias, you know, the fact that they spread lies, laced with anger and hate faster and further. And then, so think about it like this, you go up one more step to the actual business model. And this business model takes everything you post on their platforms, brings all of that together, uses machine learning to give you, to create a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. So now there's this model of you and me and everyone who uses the platform here. That's the the model called surveillance capitalism. And that model is what is being used to determine how to target you, how to be able to micro-target you with advertising. So where do you want legislation? In these two areas, not here. When you look at these two areas, you can target them in two ways, right? You look, they have to be, greater transparency in terms of the behavior that they are creating because they're coding it in and it is by machine. You know, imagine one editor's decision multiplied millions of times. That's what the machine does. So we would, this is part of what DSA demands is more transparency on that. The second thing is accountability. Who really is accountable for genocide in Myanmar, for example, you know, for fomenting hate in human beings. Again, Singapore knows this better than any other country, right? You do not want to have a spark, create ethnic conflict. But in many ways, that is what the social media platforms are actually doing, right? It's almost like it it gags. You know, there's this old cartoon when I was growing up, there's a devil and angel on your shoulder and it's in your head. They whisper things to you. In your head, you try to make the right choices. Except with social media, the angel is gagged and flicked off your shoulder. And the devil becomes, you know, tens of feet tall and given a megaphone directly into your head. Right? That's the world we live in today. I'm so sorry to keep going on about these information ecosystems. But you have to understand that being a journalist today, when we create content, that isn't the determining factor. Distribution is. And distribution of that content is now in the hands of these tech companies that decide to distribute based on profit. That's a fundamental difference in the world, and we need to address that. Mm. I think many journalists rue the day that journalism became defined by content creation. And I, I think that as a journalist myself, with many years of experience from very long ago, and it is a very long, long time ago. Uh, journalists aren't content creators. That isn't true. Uh, yes, you need to create content, but uh, I, I, I would hope that the next generation of journalists don't think of themselves as content creators because that would really ruin, it, it would ruin the, the, the history of, of what you really do, uh, Maria. Maria, we, we're running out of time. I know I've been, um, I, I want to get to a question that on that. Some have said that, they, that uh, they feel that you may be idealistic, right? And maybe you even feel that at some level you're idealistic. But you've had, of, of anyone, when you talk about, okay, it's International Women's Day, when you talk about the attacks, networked misogyny as an example, no one has been hit more than Maria Ressa. Nobody on this planet. If you actually know how social media has targeted her and on what levels, You've had all of these threats against you. You have outstanding cases that face you. 
Tell us what challenges you go through to hang on to your ideals. I am idealistic and I want to stay idealistic. Look, I mean, I'm old. I'm old. I'm in my, why not? I don't mind. I'm 58 years old this year, right? I'm going to turn 59. And yes, I believe in the good. And that's despite being a journalist who's seen all the bad, right? Because in the bad, I've always seen such generosity of spirit, you know, like it, there's, I have a thing in my computer where there's this gentleman who inevitably, when I was still reporting for CNN, there would be a typhoon. And there's this area that always gets, his home gets demolished every year. And I would land and there he would be sitting and he would offer us whatever he had. There is always the good. Um, look, I think that you have to be idealistic. Whether you're a journalist, whether you're a business, whether you're in government, because if you're not, how are you able to actually let go of your own selfishness and try to work for the greater good? That's the mission of journalism, right? I, I, why do, how can I still be idealistic? Because I've seen it. Rappler, by all accounts, probably should have been shut down in 2018, when the government took away, they tried to take away our license to operate, but we continue to fight and we are fighting it in court. I intend to win these cases in court, but we couldn't have done this alone. You know, I believe that people see the good. And I think that, you know, that's part of what we want to, I guess, our shared humanity is what makes it so special and so magical. And here's the part on International Women's Day. People always tell you that, you know, women are weak or, you know, that you have to be a certain way to be strong. Mm -hmm. When I first started reporting for CNN, my boss sent back my tape. This is back in the days when it would take two weeks to get a tape back and forth, right? And he sent it back and he said, you know, you sound, you, you're, you look too young, you sound weak, so go drink some uh, brandy and make your voice deeper. This was, this was the training I got, right? <laughs> anyway, um, what it did do for me is you realize that everyone has stereotypes of strength, but the real strength comes from within. And I find women actually possess a particular strength that holds not just you start with a family, but you also move forward. You need empathy that women bring in. And of course, men also have this. But I guess 50 percent, you know, you hold up half the sky. So on International Women's Day, I think we're at this moment again where we need to reassess what strength means at a time when lies and bombastic kind of statements are crowding out our humanity. And we have to go back to that because that is how we will get through this time period, remembering our shared humanity and remembering our vulnerabilities and having empathy for each other. Maria, I know that somewhere on a mood board at Rappler.com, there, there are some words that have been scrolled there saying power is female. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Maria Ressa, CEO of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is now time for a short break at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022. Tea and coffee are going to be served to you at your tables. Uh, when we come back, though, from this session, your, your coffee break, Oteli Edwards, my colleague, is going to have a panel discussion up here on the stage. A little bit of housekeeping. We're still in the era of the pandemic, so keep your masks on. Don't mingle with anybody on the other table. Stay to your designated mingling areas. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, you can network with those people as well. Uh, while you're having your coffee as well, there... You can scan the pigeonhole QR code on your tablets, send in your questions for the panel that Otelia Edwards is going to have, uh, and those QR codes from our supporting partners, they are also on your tables as well. Uh, scan those 
and uh, Leadership Summit uh, 2022 Women Inspiring Change YouTube live feed. How fabulous was it to have Don Tan speak with Maria Ressa? I'm sure you enjoyed that chat. Well, guys, um, as you heard Don say, and they're still having their coffee in the boardroom, but out here in the lobby outside the ballroom, we're having a great time talking with a lot of inspiring women. My name is Yasmin Yonkers, and um, you might have heard me on stage earlier with Mrs. Josephine Teo, who's Minister for Communications and Information, and also Ms. Jane Sun spoke with Julie Yu. She's the CEO of Trip.com. And let's not forget Maria Ressa, who was just absolutely wonderful, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Well, ladies and gentlemen... We've got a lot more coming up and uh, right here on YouTube Live as well as in the ballroom. Right now, though, my chat is with a woman you're about to meet in a, a panel discussion with Oteli Edwards in a short while. Ritu Chandi joins us. She's head of BMW Group Financial Services Region Asia Pacific at BMW Group. Ritu, thank you for joining us today. Happy International Women's Day. And to you, Yasmin. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. What does a day like this mean to you? It means a lot. The fact that we will be sitting on stage in a few moments with three CEOs, senior leaders in diverse industries is very symbolic. It's symbolic for the times ahead. Okay, that's great. I'm looking forward to that conversation. But give us a preview now, shall you? Oh, shall we? Um, a BMW group report says BMW sees diversity as a strength, and that's why it targets for the long-term advancement of women in the company. How does this work? So when you think of the automotive sector, you don't generally think women in leadership. BMW is trying to change that. We've set ourselves goals with integrated reporting, with ESG as a criteria. Every senior executive, including the board, is compensated based on certain targets for diversity and inclusion in leadership. We have targets to grow the numbers. Just for context, globally, at the moment, 19% of our senior leaders are women. Not a huge number, but what's promising is today that number in Asia Pacific is 31% and growing. That's just one way. There's several grassroots initiatives as well, Yasmin, because it has to start from the very beginning. We're starting with training initiatives for women in engineering. We're starting with progressive parental leave policies, and the list goes on. But it doesn't sound like the pandemic's done anything to damage the hiring of women in your process. The pandemic, if anything, in my opinion, has been a progressive stance towards women in leadership. The pandemic has allowed hybrid working models. It has allowed people to, of course, find their space and flexibility. Yes, we're in the manufacturing sector. You can't build cars in your living room. So it's also meant in those industries requiring people to go into work which will mean that we will never be an organization with 100% work from mode, home mode, but really some, an organization somewhere in the middle. Um, furthermore, I think the pandemic's also enabled leaders to understand what a diverse workforce can do with the flexibility of being working, whether it's late in the evenings, early in the mornings, when they can balance family life. So it has been, technology has been a great enabler for us, and last but not least, I think um, large corporations like BMW, we set ourselves long-term goals. Again, very transparent, very accountable long-term goals. While the pandemic might have shifted priorities in the short run, the long-term goal is still very much about diversity and leadership and holding people accountable to driving that result. As a result, it's also important that larger companies like BMW, like Google, like RBC and others that we've spoken to, play a role in shaping communities because we have the resources given the long-term perspective. That could be different to some small and medium-sized enterprises mm -hmm. that have shifting priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Pandemic, been good, generally. And the day we can build a car in our living room, please tell us. Now, listen, <laughs> you've led some senior leadership positions. You've worked in Asia Pacific, North America. Soon you're headed for Munich. How are we doing here in Asia Pacific when it comes to women in the boardroom, uh, in leadership positions at your company in the automotive region as well? So I, I'm, I'll start off by saying I think we're in a stage of evolution and we're still in the nascent stages of this evolution. So I'm not going to suggest that we're at the end game, but the movement has begun. And 
In Asia, we are leading the pack. In fact, BMW Asia, our office here in Singapore, three out of the seven senior leadership positions are women. We've, again, been very much trying to champion the cause of women coming back from maternity, coming back on a part-time basis, more progressive parental leave. Um, I mean, we talk about international careers. We've actually even found solutions for trailing spouses in our teams to make sure both, you know, both the family is engaged to ensure that there's economic activity beyond just the person employed by BMW. The business case for this one is quite simple, if you really think about it, Yasmin. At the end, from our perspective, we have to, BMW Group and its leadership has to be a kaleidoscope of all the perspectives we need to take into account to serve our customers and communities better. Mm -hmm. And that's people like you and everyone else. Right. And interestingly enough, one thing that doesn't get mentioned enough, most women are very actively involved when it comes to the purchasing decision of a car. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> I can identify with that. Thank you so much. And good luck with your next gig in Munich. Yeah, hope to see you then and brush up on your German. I'll be working on it. Thank you. Ritu Chandi from BMW Group. You can catch her on the panel discussion later. Can't wait to hear what she would have to say. Uh, we have somebody else that we're chatting with in a short while, but allow me first to take a moment to share the messages uh, uh, from our partners here at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022, because this event would not be possible without them. Each day, we strive to drive, shape, and improve our world. What we do now as women, as leaders, doesn't just influence today. It provides a platform for a more equitable future. The trust we built through understanding and listening. The opportunities we help create for other generations. They are all the start of a journey. We believe that on any journey, we can only move forward when we know where we stand and what we stand for. This joy is electric. This joy is electric and we're circuiting through. I'm so happy that Graduating around the height of COVID was a really challenging situation. I applied for a lot of jobs, but I didn't hear back from any of them. The Google Skills Ignition Singapore program is a very strategic partnership between Google and the Singapore government for us to structure training around emergent skills uh, in cloud computing, digital marketing. After completing the program at Google, I was very fortunate to land a job. At the end of the day, you will have definitely learned something important about yourself from it. Thank you so much to all our partners here at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022, Women Inspiring Change. This wouldn't be possible without you. Well, I tell you what, on the panel later, uh, you've met Ritu. Now you're going to meet the next person who's going to be on that panel too. Sapna Chada is Vice President of Marketing at Google Southeast Asia and India. And Sapna joins us now. Hello there. It's been a nice long day. I know I spoke with you this morning on radio and on TV. And here we are in front here of the are. cameras at YouTube. Listen, gender equality, is it just a women's issue? Oh, absolutely not. I think ultimately gender equality is around equity and inclusion across the board, right? And I think you can look at a sense of belonging that everybody needs to have. This isn't just about gender. Um, this is around representation. It's around equity. It's not just a women's issue. If you think about intersectionality and all of the, the diversity that exists in the world, it's important that we cast a light on this today, and that's why I'm excited about Women's Day. I think it casts a light on equity and inclusion across the board. Mm. You know, we heard the minister earlier talk about, um, you know, Singapore clamping a little harder on, on, on people who violate women's, you know, safety. And the online space is a lot being discussed as a place that may not be very safe for women. How is Google helping in that respect? Well, I think we take this very seriously. Obviously, platforms are very responsible. I need to, you know, go, go out of our way to make sure that we are clamping down on bad actors. Let's say, for example, making sure that as women could be harassed online, right? Are we calling that out? Are we taking down 
um, you know, content that could be negative? And are we holding people accountable? At YouTube, we spend a significant amount of resource and time, uh, both through artificial intelligence and machine learning, but also through our own uh, you know, manual efforts to make sure that we can do whatever best and what's possible uh, to keep people safe online. And how can we make women richer? I know you've got your, your Sati project, mm. which I'm so, so impressed by. And I talked about that in, on TV this morning, that incense stick makers, the papadam <laughs> lady, the chutney lady yeah. gets to earn something. I mean, besides just your project in India, how does Google make finances better for women? Well, it's about making sure that we, we say that it's about universal access to information and equity, right? And so you have to level the playing field. That could be education. It could be awareness. It could be knowledge. It could be confidence and giving women confidence. So whether in India with the Sati program, which we have, we, we enable women with the insights and the knowledge that they need to be able to build businesses online, to be able to do great things. A lot of times they hold themselves back because they don't know what they could get from such an opportunity. But when you... You enable women to enable other women. Um, that's power, right? And that's what the Sati program does. You create a community where women are helping women um, to move forward. But we also believe at Google that it's our role. Everybody can't just help themselves. We have to spend our time educating. So whether it's here in Singapore with helping women tech makers, with education in terms of coding and computer science, we have Google generation scholars in the computer science space. We all need to play a role to make sure that where we do see inequities, because women in STEM, um, for example, which we spoke about this morning, like the, the rates are not where they need to be, and women are pulling themselves out. So what we need to do is help to give them confidence, and confidence usually comes through knowledge. We say information is empowering, information is democratizing, and so that's, uh, that's how we at Google make sure that we can spread the information as much as possible. And you made a big point this morning about parenting and educators playing yes. that role as well yes. to push women in the STEM space. Yes. I mean, women need role models and women need to be pushed, right? And I think it starts from a young age. I have twins, one boy and one girl, <laughs> and I'm always constantly making sure that I'm not saying things that really play to biases. I mean, girls shouldn't be playing with crafts and decorating cookies while boys are doing things in the sciences. Right? We need to make sure as parents that we avoid biases, um, but we also need role models. I spoke about that as well. I, my mother was a woman in tech. I don't think it's a coincidence that I've entered the tech space. Um, she played a role. Fantastic. Yeah. Inspiring story. Good luck on the panel. Thank we can't you. wait to hear what you have to, to say. Thank you and happy Take Women's care. Day. Thank, Thank you. you. You too, Bye. Sapna. Sapna Chada from Google there. I hope you're enjoying the summit so far, guys. Uh, in a short while, you'll meet Sapna, you'll meet Ritu, uh, uh, together with uh, Tae Hui Ling from RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, on stage with Otelli Edwards. Uh, but right now, um, I want you to meet a woman here in Singapore who was featured on a CNA lifestyle program that we had on CNA TV. She's Singapore's only certified female brewmaster. Her name is Cristala Huang. Here's her story. I was just like poking fun, I'm like, what are you doing that? What's going on? And Dad said, okay, since you're such a nosy person, you can come and help me to brew. So that's how I started brewing. What made you think that, you know what, this is the industry that I can conquer? I sort of grew up in the industry, and therefore, at 16, I decided I really like to brew, I really like to cook. When it first started off, I was actually very happy even though it was very, very tiring to be working that long hours in the brewery, but that's where I found, in some way, my calling. I'm just happy to be doing whatever I'm doing here. Yeah. What was that like, being the only girl? Did you always feel like you had to constantly prove yourself? Initially, yes because you're young. Yeah. I think one thing is that age is a factor. It's always a factor like, 
what is this young girl doing here? But I think time is the biggest factor. You can't cheat time. So therefore, after a while in the industry, then you get known. If you work very hard day in, day out, after that, you would gain a reputation in the industry and just be like, okay, this girl knows her stuff. So therefore, then the respect comes. You can't expect respect outright. It's not going to work anywhere in this world. And research also shows me that brewers were female to begin with yeah. back in the day. So the skills are there for female. Brewing is actually a multidisciplinary job. You have to think about this. And then while this is boiling, you have to think about what's the next step. And then if let's say something goes wrong, you have to preempt the problem. So it's uh, all this is all multitasking. I was just going to say the multitasking part of it all is a female's basically her home court. When you're in the industry, can you recall maybe like any moment where you felt like you were discriminated by your fellow brewers? If you walk into a brewer's control of 500 people, maybe about 10 of us are ladies. And out of these 10, maybe 5 ladies are from marketing. Some of them are from like just the back end. So it ends up only 2 or 3 of us are actually the real brewers. These guys all cannot differentiate. So when it comes to this discrimination whatsoever, just take it at face value. I'm my greatest competitor, and then after that, you just go on from there. What would you say to the little girls out there who are interested in doing what you do? I would say just go for it. Just relax. Don't think about so much. Don't think about what other people say. Just go for it. Just knock on every possible door that you can actually knock on. And one door will open one day, and you say, okay, and just work, put your head down and work, and then just figure your way out from there. Yeah. I say cheers to that. I say cheers to that too. And to more female brewers in Singapore. Indeed. I think it was just amazing to see them do that little toast. If you want to hear more of Cristala Huang's story, you want to watch that again, go to the CNA Lifestyle uh, video. And I'm sure if you just Google there, Cristala Huang, you'll get the story on CNA Lifestyle. Thank you so much for enjoying that along with me. We're going to take you to the ballroom shortly. We'll be listening in on a panel discussion that seeks to find out what the best practices are and the hiring policies are that can help improve gender equality and promote women leadership. We're going to hear from more women leaders from RBC, BMW and Google. And my colleague, Oteli Edwards, who hosts Asia Now on CNA will be the moderator. It's kind of nice being here at the CNA Leadership Summit because it takes us away a little bit from the usual roles that we have on CNA. And for me, it's a nice chance to come out of the radio studio where I normally am. Okay, um, you can watch any of this all the time on YouTube, uh, YouTube Live, and, and coming up as well, after we chat with uh, the ladies in the boardroom, you're going to hear from two entrepreneurs from the tech industry who are making waves in their respective fields. And I will be there to take you through that conversation. So much happening today. We now go back to the ballroom here at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022, Women Inspiring Change. My name is Yasmin Yonkers. Something important about yourself from it. <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from your uh, coffee break and uh, welcome to the final fireside session with me, Oteli Edwards. Uh, I produce and present our main news programs uh, like Asia Now on uh, CNA and I'm also going to be your moderator for this uh, final session, something that I'm very excited about and um, I'm basically hoping that today's honest discussion with our panel will inspire positive changes for women. And of course, at the same time, we're gonna ask those difficult questions that will hopefully drive that change into action. Now, um, I'm thrilled today, as you can see, three other empty seats. I'm gonna be sharing the stage with uh, three high-flying, um, high-powered career women in the private sector powerhouses. So they're gonna be reflecting on their own personal experiences uh, in leadership position, as well as their perspectives on issues facing women across the region. So where exactly are the fault lines and where are the opportunities? How can we exactly carve out new roles and uh, possibilities in a post-pandemic world? Uh, we've already gained a fair bit of insight from our speakers today, but uh, our guests today will basically help us look at problems uh, with a different lens and a different sense. So um, without further ado, 
I would like to invite our panelists today. First up, Ms. Sapna Chada, Vice President of Marketing, Google, Southeast Asia and India. Next, we have Ms. Ritu Chandi, Head of BMW Group Financial Services, Region Asia Pacific, BMW Group. And last but not least, we have Ms. Tae Hui Ling, Head of Business Strategy, Risk and Governance, Royal Bank of Canada. Well, warm welcome, ladies. We have been told we have about 35 minutes. We have plenty to cover, so let's get started. Um, firstly, I just want to take the temperature of um, this current issue of gender equality in the corporate world, and um, I just want to find out what are your headline thoughts on where we are. So uh, perhaps, Sapna, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to go back to what Josephine Tio, Minister Tio, said earlier today. I think there's, there's pros, there's areas of progress, there's areas where we're moving forward, and there's areas where we still have a lot of work to do. I think, um, obviously, the areas where we've made progress um, are really in, in, in advancing women in the workforce. I know at Google, we've been committed to this to make sure that in the tech sector, which is traditionally an area where we haven't had the equity that we wanted, that we publish our data, that we have an annual report, and we're showing progress year on year. We've actually had the most success. Um, we've reached our highest rates of women um, in the workforce and even in women in leadership positions, but we still have work to do. It's not one and done. It's not a silver bullet. There's a long way to go. Um, there's also um, a lot of progress that we've made um, when it comes to uh, women and leadership positions, right? I think I can point to a number of role models internally that I see that really propel us forward. And so I feel optimistic about where we are, but there's still a long road, right? I think we've talked about the pandemic, its impact, 75% of women um, are taking care of all of the unpaid care that's happening. But I think this is an area we've talked about earlier um, when we were backstage, was companies and organizations are helping to say, Let's talk about care. Let's talk about how we make progress. And I can speak again ab about Google. I'm optimistic because we've acknowledged that carers leave is required. And it's not a gender issue only. Everybody needs to think about care. Um, and we need to go beyond this being just about gender equity, but about doing what's right for our workforce. So I'm optimistic um, that there's programs and policies that are in place that are making the world more equitable. And uh, Ritu, what about BMW? I mean, what are some of the gaps and what are some of the things that you've seen that has worked, uh, you know, that, has, that promotes gender equality at BMW? Well, thank you for having me, Otelli. And it's fantastic to be here in this room with those beautiful cars on either side. And <laughs> hopefully some of you will drive away with one of those. Um, let me just start off by saying that the three of us sitting here is symbolic. It's an important, very important time for us to just acknowledge that for a moment. Does that mean that we're there? No, we're not. Um, I'd, I'd say it's, a, it's an evolution. Gender equality and parity in the workforce, particularly in corporate workforce, is in a stage of evolution. And we're probably at the nascent stages where um, you can see the little offsprings, you can see some results, and you can see why it is definitely a topic of discussion on every boardroom's agenda. Mm -hmm. um, large corporations like Google, like RBC, like BMW, we're like um, small republics. I'm quoting Indra Nui here. She, she calls us small republics. Um, we play a very active role when it comes to shaping societies, when it comes to really determining what the future could look like. And in the case of BMW, we've set very specific goals. We were one of the first OEMs, European OEMs, to go f away from just financial reporting and say, for us, it's about ESG. And it's not just about you know, uh, greenwashing and just talking about emissions, but it's truly about 
social responsibility, whether it's social responsibility in the supply chain or diversity in inclusion in leadership. And for that, we set very specific targets and board compensation is measured on those targets. So it is truly transparent and accountable. Mm -hmm. There are several initiatives that I'm sure we'll also discuss through grassroots levels, but I think making this top of the agenda, making senior executives, setting the tone from the top, making them accountable and responsible is definitely where we need to begin because one day there will be a time where it will be purely a mindset and it will be about meritocracy in the workforce, but we're not there yet. Not there yet. Now, when it comes to the banking sector, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea, you know, it's that it's still largely male-dominated, and it's almost as if, like, you know, women, you have to be doubly aggressive, you have to be confrontational, you have to be willing to travel, you have to, you know, sort of make work your priority, such that um, possibly not having that dependent care responsibilities. And is that still true for the banking sector? Well, the banking, I've been in the banking sector for quite a long time. And I must say that it has evolved, especially over the last two years. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, you know, I wouldn't disagree with the statement that um, it is male-dominated. But I think the roles have evolved over time. And increasingly so, we can see that, you know, um, there are more opportunities given um, to women um, in, 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 in this industry. And as the pandemic has shown, right, a lot of um, so-called requirements that, that requires people, um, candidates or, or leaders to travel is no longer a prerequisite. And so it's becoming more and more achievable for, for women across, um, you know, all, all spectrum to, to really compete for those um, jobs or even do well in those jobs. So, I, so, yeah, back to the point, it has evolved and um, that I would say that um, we are coming a long way. And to your point, um, we, have, we, have, um, we have done a lot. We have seen a lot of women um, becoming more and more financially independent. And in fact, in the banking sector, in the private banking sector, we see also women being, becoming our high net worth clients and um, you know, ultra high net worth clients and I aspire one day um, you know, that my daughter own one of those cars so that I can sit in it. <laughs> and I would like to chime in here that uh, yes. Huiling's daughter is actually among mm -hmm. us uh, yeah, today there, and, yes. and it really shows that you know, as a career woman, I mean, you are trying to do the best of everything, right? Being a mother, being, being a, a, a wife as well as you know, being um, a staff uh, you know, at, at your bank. Um, but uh, I just want to bring in the fact that we're talking about what's been happening in the last two years and obviously we know that the pandemic has shifted things uh, quite mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, just based on some of the latest uh, findings we have from Lancet, women uh, are more likely than men to report employment loss, uh, as well as foregoing work to care for others. Women and girls more likely to drop out of school, not to mention that there has been an increase in uh, domestic violence as well during the pandemic. But um, just from your experience, uh, like Sapna, over the last two years, we talk about job losses. Are you seeing that at Google, where women are giving up their roles uh, you know, to be caregivers? I think what was said here is I think the three of us are privileged. We're in, a, we're in unique positions. I don't think, um, I, I know personally, we, I haven't seen this happen at Google. Um, in fact, we're seeing real progress, as I mentioned. When, when we're accountable to ourselves around progressing women in leadership positions and otherwise, we've made progress there. But I can't also uh, cast a blind eye to what's happening in the world, right? And the world at large and who we represent. We represent a whole user base. Uh, we represent the world, right? And when we see what women are struggling with, the questions that they're asking on Google search every day, you can see that there is a, a, a lot of hardship, right? And, and we take responsibility to say, how can we help through information? Information is empowerment. Information is democratizing. How can we help in those instances? Because while I might not face it in the rooms that I'm in, I see it um, in the impact in the world that we live in and large. So whether it's small businesses and the impact that they've had, um, they don't have um, you know, the, the opportunities that we have perhaps with hybrid work. And we've all been making it work with hybrid work. We have to think about how businesses have suffered and they've struggled and how women have struggled. But um, what I can say is I also have, I take solace in the fact that 
when women have access to information, they do amazing things. And when women are struggling, the answers that they can get, that we can help them with, can help them in those tough times. Mm. And, and of course, you have the data to back that up, um, you know, which sort of leads me to the next question about, you know, how um, firms, big firms, medium-sized firms, you know, what sort of policies or, or data collection you have in place to actually track that, whether it's got to do with women in leadership roles or it's got to do with the fact that, um, you know, you, th there's a pay gap and you need to sort of narrow that. Um, well, definitely, we're a very data-driven organization, as one might uh, expect. So, again, starting with the transparency and accountability at senior levels, um, we've got targets. And just maybe to give you a bit of context, um, in 2021, 19% of BMW Group's senior leadership was female. Now, that's not a starting, startlingly large number, but we've set a target that we're going to grow that to 22% and beyond in the next two years. But in Asia, in 2021, that number was 31% and growing. Mm. In Singapore, in our regional office in Singapore, three out of the seven senior leadership positions are women. So I, I must take a moment again to, you know, paint somewhat of an optimistic picture here. Whilst we have a job cut out for us, absolutely, but again here, Asia is leading the way, and I think we should acknowledge that. Um, when it came to data, it was also about gender parity in terms of pay. And this is something that we are also very much looking at at every level of leadership to ensure that we're narrowing that gap. We're also looking at, um, really, at grassroots level initiatives to work with universities in terms of providing a pipeline of talent, whether it's sectors like engineering. I mean, what's, what's not very well known, for instance, you know, you wouldn't have thought of a product designer being a woman. Well, the IX standing outside, if you haven't seen it, please do, <laughs> designed by a woman. Uh, the nice. new, the new um, 8 series, which we just advertised with the color-changing technology, designed by a woman. So there are, there are really impressive examples where we're really trying to you know, almost encourage and develop that talent pool. Um, and of course, uh, it is also about finding the balance within the workforce. We, we encourage leadership at all levels, we encourage leadership to be mobile and international, but when we do that, we need to find potential support for you know, trailing spouses, and we've been able to do that. We've been able to find engagement and rewarding opportunities within BMW or outside for trailing spouses. So these are all things that can be done, but it starts, as I said, with KPIs, data, policies, framework, and then the mindset. Mm. Because there you are talking that, you know, women make most of the, the, the decision, right, to purchase something. Absolutely. I'm thinking whether is it because the other half just want peace at home and they don't <laughs> want to, you know, you've got to pick, pick your battles. Uh, but Huiling, you know, during the pandemic, right, um, as companies struggle to, you know, think about their bottom lines and, um, uh, and obviously a lot of companies have, have suffered losses because of the pandemic, etc. Don't you think priorities such as, you know, gender equality and all of that has actually taken a back seat? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very good question. And during this, this period where we struggle, it's really a hard time. But that is when the values, your values really showed up the strongest in the crisis, right? And for the bank, um, yesterday, I think I did mention in the interview at Asia First as well, that um, we actually place diversity and inclusion as a pillar, as a values that we have. And it's seated right up there next to the value of integrity. So, you know, for the banking sector, what is unique to us that should be giving everyone's confidence is really the integrity. And integrity is the other values that we have. So, um, we have that right next to um, integrity, accountability, client first. And so, so, so imagine that coming through during this period, it is, it is very strong. Um, so it did not take a back seat. In fact, um, it grew stronger. And yeah, if I could give you an example of, uh, I also like to leverage the, 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 the whole philosophy about um, accepting each other, the vulnerability that we share, and um, about, you know, um, the leaders accepting um, the, when, we, when we reach out to them, they are able to, to, um, to respond to us positively. So if I could share an example, which I really want to, is during, during this period last year, um, you know, I actually had a very tough time. And I reached out to my, um, my male colleague, 
who, who are all in the boardroom and they're looking strong. And I, I told him about the, uh, the, the issue that I struggled and it's all the challenge that I struggled with. And he said, you know, feel free to reach out to the boss. He will be understanding. And I did. And he, he, my, my boss actually asked me in return and said that, what can I do to help you? Mm. So this whole episode made me realize that, you know, um, while we view somebody else as stronger and more, um, seems to be a stronger leader than us, but every one of us, we are human. We all share our vulnerabilities, leaders too. And when we are able to go out and show that vulnerability, it actually demonstrates to, the, to our one down, to our direct reports, to our team members, that it is okay to reach out it is okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I think this is really important during this period and ever more so going forward that, um, you know, um, that leaders be accessible and even it's okay to show the humanity side of you, to, to be vulnerable and, that, and you be surprised at the kind of support that you get from the people who are working for you. So you mentioned that, you know, leaders have to be... Uh, more accessible to, you know, your, your staff. So the, the new normal or the next normal is going to be hybrid working, right? And do you find that it works for women or against women? And I'm saying that because, as you know, I mean, yes, we have the option of taking Zoom calls. And as you know, in Singapore, we have, you know, the, the three most dreaded words for parents, right? It's like home-based learning. And then on top of that, I have to work at home. And then, you know, who's taking care of, you know, especially if your kids are not are young or they're not, yeah not motivated enough and you have to be there. How, how do you, how did, I mean, how did you juggle? Because each and every one of you, you're a mom as well. I, I could go first. Um, I think that this whole, um, for, for, for the pandemic, the work from home, um, it can benefit or not. It really depends on how you make the best of that situation, right? And um, yes, you know, my daughter, she is an expert on iPad. So I did not realize two years ago when the pandemic started, when home-based learning kicked in, that she has no idea how to navigate the e-learning platform. Mm. And so I was trying to juggle these um, Zoom calls, WebEx, and she's sitting next to me and saying, how do you do, how do you get into this? How do you log in? How do you, what is the password? You know, so, so we have to deal with that. And, um, but we made the best of the, of the whole situation and we spent so much more time together. So I think at the end of the day is how you leverage every circumstances that is given to you. And like the saying that goes, when the, when the world, the life throws you lemons, you make lemonades out of it. I think that is very true. Mm. So Ritu, how did you make lemonades during this pandemic? <laughs> 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 Um, maybe starting personally first, um, with an almost four-year-old and six-year-old, working from home was not a dream. <laughs> no. So I couldn't wait for the day that I could get back into the office, candidly speaking. <laughs> um, no, it, it had its own challenges. At some point, you just stop apologizing for, you know, your child screaming out that they were done and needed you, and, or coming into the room and sitting on your lap while you were on a call. Um, Having said that, though, as, as a manufacturing company with, you know, cars at, at the core of our brand, you, you don't build cars in your living room, not, not today. So we also had to really find that equity in the workforce. So it was very much work from home, absolutely stay safe, but we do have a production line we need to keep going. So leaders compensated and really set the tone in that regard. For me, what's important is the future. If I think of 2022 and beyond, I don't think we'll ever be at a day where every single person is expected to be in the office from nine to five and necessarily have that same level of face time or engagement that people were expected to have. But I also don't believe we're going to be working purely and solely from home. So if we think about diversity and gender parity, and I, I side with you here, uh, definitely, Sapna, and you're enabling us all, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, technology is going to enable us. Technology is going to enable us to have that balance, have that hybrid ability to flex, sort of have more flexibility in our schedule, to be there for your children um, if they have a performance <laughs> at school uh, and... Um, be at work when you need to be and jump on a call when you need to be. So we're, go we're going to be able to do it, which is only going to, again, enable gender diversity in the workforce. And also, I'm wondering from an economic perspective, Sapna, um, do you see 
uh, more gender diverse companies faring better? Well, I think the data has shown um, that you know, diverse workforces drive more innovation and have an impact on the bottom line, right? And I think to your question earlier, has this taken a backseat? I think it's the opposite. In fact, right, you know, you, companies today are paying attention about being inclusive because I think there's a stat that about 60% of the workforce will choose to work elsewhere if they see a more inclusive culture somewhere else, right? And so this is an imperative. This is a, it, it impacts everything that we do. And I think part of the reason why we want to get back to hybrid is because we realize that when we're in person and when we're interacting together, it does drive more innovation. It's easier. I think there's benefits to the technology. As a mother myself, not traveling as much during the last few years has been great. Um, I actually worry that we're going to go back to the insane travel at, at times. I've seen this time where as a chance to reconnect with my kids and not be gone as much as I was in the past. So I think we need to think about the positives, right, and, and the satisfaction that will come from hybrid. I think there's a lot of merit in it. You, there's flexibility, there's choices that can be made. I think people hopefully will make better choices as we go forward. But ultimately this comes down to, it's about inclusion. This isn't about gender equity only. This is about people feeling that they belong and that they're, and they're appreciated. And for that, you do need to show up in, 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 you know, in person at times, but not all the time, right? And I think that, that balance will lead to more productivity and better impact. And like I said, the data has shown that this is very important for every company's bottom line. It's all about the data, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, I was also wondering in your experience, I mean, you're on the board, you know, you're on lots of different boards and, you know, you are with different communities. And what were some of the projects or some of the policies that some companies you've seen or perhaps even in your company, you've seen that made you go like, wow, like I should really introduce this back at work? Well, I mean, I, I also will call out that this has been a great time. We were talking about for networking and being on boards. And as women, right, sometimes we don't um, make time for this historically, right? And we prioritize children, caregiving, our work. This has been a great time to actually participate on boards. So I'll just say mm -hmm. it's a, a plug for that because it's been, it's less time consuming in a virtual world sometimes. <laughs> um, but I, so what have I seen? I, I, I will... I will call attention to something that I really appreciate from Google, which is carer's leave. Um, and this, again, goes beyond maternal or maternity leave or paternity leave. It's carer's leave. Because what we've all realized, and we should have realized this before, is that we're all human, as was said. We all have challenges that may come up from time to time. And are we supporting people during times of crisis, when you have an aging parent, when you're dealing with COVID, when you're dealing with home-based learning, um, and so this is something that I hope more uh, organizations uh, really look to this. We've recently increased our parental leave policies because we've realized, again, the positive impact that it has um, in terms of employee satisfaction, which ultimately impacts productivity. So that's something I, you know, when I bring it up, a lot of people are surprised. What, you got, you could get up to 18 weeks of carer's leave? Yeah, <laughs> like that, I hope more companies do the same. I sure hope so, too. <laughs> now, just moving ahead and, uh, you know, the road ahead, looking at the vision. Um, globally, actually, studies have shown that women in the labor force, um, they're paid less, they hold fewer senior positions, and participate less in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And a UNESCO report found that women represent only 29%, for instance, of science R&D positions globally, and are already 25% less likely than men to know how to leverage digital technology. So just going forward, um, is that, I mean, how can, yeah, women level up if, for instance, just science or math is just not their thing? Uh, so I, I definitely believe um, there's different facets to this question. First and foremost, you talked about statistics and performance. Stakeholder capitalism is going to require more sustainable leadership, which is going to be more diverse. If we want companies and organizations to make better decisions, our organizations and our leadership have to be um, the kaleidoscope of the perspectives we want to represent, the products we want to offer, the services we want to offer. So, and I think this is going to become an expectation from investors going forward as well. So, you know, it's not just going to be about just one return parameter. 
as we talk about emission standards, we talk about sustainability in supply chain, it's going to be about sustainability in leadership. Mm -hmm. Having said all of that, it, it, to get more people um, engaged, it's uh, going to require a mindset shift. So tone from the top, we talked about that, but also a mind sh mindset shift. Um, for me, it doesn't matter which industry you're in, Women have succeeded so far, and I speak personally because I had excellent support from great male mentors, truly. And that's the reason I am where I am today. So I'm not vilifying men or women here, but at the end of the day, you needed that strong engagement from mentors to support the cause. Mm. And it's, again, that mindset that has to start with also encouraging training and development to create more and more women in, you know, in those fields like STEM that you talked about to create the pipeline of talent. Interestingly enough, research shows that actually women, there is a, a relatively reasonable uh, proportion of women that actually enter engineering or science or IT. It's post joining the workforce, post um, potentially taking maternity leave, and definitely, you know, I think we heard this earlier from Josephine and some of the other speakers, it's usually, you, the pyramid gets, or it gets narrow and narrow the higher you go up the, the pyramid. So that's what we really need to address here. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's got to be about setting those intentions, ensuring that we have the right role models with the right conditioning, so we're able to break those unconditional biases in those discussions in the boardroom. And really, how do you see um, women's role in... Uh post-recovery uh, period. Are you positive? Are you optimistic? Oh, yes. Um, de definitely, right? Because during this time, you realize that we do, I mean, during the whole pandemic, we do a lot of Zoom, we do a lot of virtual meetings, and you, you manage teams virtually, and you, and you need to really leverage the, 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 the intuition that a woman has and the sensitivity that we have as well, so that you know, you know, um, how your team is doing. And, um, I'm very proud to, to, to say that you know, Royal Bank of Canada has, um, has done um, quite a lot during this period to make us really, truly proud to, to work for the bank. Um, you know, so we talk about um, child, child care leaves, right? And so we, we actually, um, in the first year when we started into the pandemic, what really touched me as an employee was that the bank declared that there would be no um, job losses in that year. And that gives us the assurance and therefore the confidence to really work on pivoting um, our next steps. And, um, and, you know, so, and then subsequent follow-ups is like allowances to ensure that we are well equipped at home. You know, and um, we also have our fair share of childcare leave and a day, a day of leave that is being given to us. So all this really made the employees feel that the, the bank cares. You know, and that is very important um, during this period and moving forward. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, I'll tell you, so just before we move on, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say this as well, that um, we would like to also take this um, time to, 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 uh, to show our appreciation and make a donation um, to the United Singapore, um, um, sorry, United Women Singapore, okay. a non-profit Foundation, um, association that, um, that is focused on moving the, the women equality and empowerment agenda. So they are seated here today with us um, and well, I'd like to just give the acknowledgement. Yeah. yeah, deeply appreciated, especially times like this. Um, and um, actually, I'm going to move on to, because time is running out, so we have actually some questions from our pigeonhole. Uh, from our audience here, and uh, I think there's a very, very brave gentleman. I'll just call him Mr. Bo here. He's got a question for our panelists. What are men still doing wrong to support women's careers, even though they have the intention to do right? Help us understand the blind spots that men typically have. So, who would like to weigh in? Maybe I'll, I can go first, right? <laughs> so, my husband is there. There we go. <laughs> so did, he, did he write that yeah. question? <laughs> so, that is support, right? That is yeah. a demonstration of a support. Um, he has a full day agenda. He cancelled everything and he just come here and support. Um, but I, I think that it is the assumption because a lot of us women, we tend to internalise a lot of things. We carry a lot of things on our shoulders. And just because sometimes we don't express that, it doesn't mean that 
we are okay, you know. Uh, we want to be strong for our family, we want to be strong for our um, community. So I think it's important for men to, to take that sensitive side of them, um, to, to sometimes um, check in and also, um, you know, to, to level up the playing field at home. Mm. Okay, and perhaps just uh, one more question for uh, Sapna and Ritu. Um, oh, we've got, we've got a 10-year-old girl here with a question. What quality or qualities should I develop to be future successful female leader like yourself? Did you say to I that? I can start. I have a 10-year-old daughter, so <laughs> oh, yeah. it immediately came in to my mind. I, um, I always talk about my mother's role in, my, in where I am today. She was a woman in tech, so the idea of me studying information systems or becoming a systems analyst, these are things that never even occurred to me as um, the wrong thing to do. So have being... Like having role models is very important. But the biggest thing that she role modeled for me was confidence and bravery. I think the, that many times, and we were talking about this back, backstage, we self-select. We pull ourselves out. We might be pushing forward in technology. We don't see people that, you know, the room looks equal. We, we step back sometimes. And the worst thing we can do is to not be confident I think it's really the only characteristic that's required um, to make sure that we don't pull out, that we stretch ourselves, that we push forward, um, and that we think we can. I think women need to sometimes feel that we need to have all the knowledge in the world to actually move ahead, but I think it's actually that we need to have all the confidence in the world uh, to move forward. Confidence and bravery. Ritu, to add to that? Um, we, we were talking about this earlier, so I have a six-year-old, um, and she has a concert this week, which I will not be able to attend because I'm jumping on a plane later this evening. I think one of the things women, and this is actually women and men, the paradox is real, and you've got to be okay with prioritizing certain things. I'm not saying it's okay to always miss certain events, but you have to make that okay for yourself. Bravery, absolutely key. And if I could just uh, maybe finish off with one last statement. You know, when we read about leadership today in this world, particularly as AI and digital and information and everything else becomes more important, it's going to be the softer skills. It's going to be about empathy. It's going to be about communicating that narrative. And women are synonymously good at that. So let's use the talent that we have. And you can, each and every one of us can be a champion here. Thank you so much, ladies. Our guests here with their insightful, sharing their insights with us. And... Uh, we hope that we have managed to, you know, identify some obstacles and also how, you know, leaders can create this culture of equality at work for men as well as women because we need uh, them to buy in. And even if there's one takeaway you got out of today's uh, discussion, uh, that is plenty. So International Women's Day, it's a day for celebrating the progress towards gender equality and women's empowerment around the world. And uh, hopefully this day also you know, reminds us how, just how much more uh, we can do for ourselves, for our family, for um, our company. And uh, we should continue to insist and advocate uh, that in all the countries, regardless of the advances uh, already made, because we need to create a space where we can educate and empower girls and women uh, to inspire change and to foster uh, a gender uh, equal world. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we have come to the end of uh, this year's CNA Leadership Summit. Uh, before we go... Obviously, I have to thank our um, partners, our official partner, R RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, our official car partner, BMW, and check out those cool cars at the side, <laughs> and uh, supporting partner, Google, for uh, supporting this uh, summit. And uh, of course, I'd have to thank each and every one of you for staying right through, for being here, and um, for, you know, just tuning in, and hopefully you can bring something back to the company and, um, you know, instill some real changes. So hope to see you again uh, next year. Thank you once again. Thank you, Oteli Edwards, and thank you to all our guests at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022. Well, all the action in the ballroom has come to a close. And in a short while, I'm going to be hearing quite a bit of uh, hustle and bustle here as uh, the women and the men who attended today are exiting. But uh, honestly, we have more to talk about. My name is Yasmin Yonkers, by the way. I'm from CNA 938 and uh, you're enjoying a YouTube live streaming of our event. Okay, let's round things up with two women who are making waves in their respective industries, 
Do women entrepreneurs have it harder? Let's get the point of view of two of my guests. Dr. Sandhya Sriram is group CEO and co-founder and chairman of Shop Meets. And Meryl Lim is co-founder of Good Vibes. And also, she's a hedonist. All right, let's get to them. Hello there, Sandhya. Hello there, Meryl. Thank you for being here. Have you been enjoying yourself today on International Women's Day? Oh, very much for sure. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. Meryl, nice to have women come together, talk about issues at work and all that. For sure. It's an honor to be here today and meeting a lot of empowered women here today. Yep. Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad you, to have your company uh, today. And uh, honestly, Sandhya, let's, ask, let's start with you. You set your foot in an industry that's about, you know, creating products for the masses and it's typically male. What's your journey like? So I come from the industry that has STEM in it, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. So interestingly, um, it is a male-dominated industry if you look at STEM in general, but just look at science and biotech. Actually, there are more females in the workforce than males. But as they go up the ladder, there are lesser, male, uh, lesser females. That's what's happening. So it's, it's an interesting mix, I would say. Um, we are a 70% female or female company. Not by design, not by choice. It just so happened that way, and I'm glad that we are there. Um, but for me specifically, as I sort of was a scientist before, and then I was an entrepreneur, I am an entrepreneur, and then a businesswoman, I realized that it's more, um, yes, we have to do a little bit more than the men, but I have accepted that that's the fact, and you have to just do it to move ahead. So I think it's sort of built in in me right now that as a woman, I just have to do more. And that's how I approach things right now. It's unfair, but I think to prove a point and to be an inspiration for future generations, you have to do that to show them that it can be done. Wow. Do you think at some point you'd get sick of it, though, this whole idea that you have to do more? I mean, listen, group CEO, co-founder, chairman, what else do you want here, you know? <laughs> I, I would say I'm in a good place right now. Uh -huh. I have done what all I needed to do, but now I need to do a little bit more to stay where I am. To, to sustain it. Okay. I think uh, inside, you know, in the last panel, the speaker spoke about sustainable leadership by women. I think that is so important. It's not just reaching that goal. It's about how long you can stay in that goal and how long you can inspire people that you can stay in that goal. You're setting examples for the future generation. You're setting examples for your kids. And you're, setting, you're, writing, you're writing a history in some page of a history book. Meryl? I know we're all inspired. Let's hear your story. Honestly, you are in an industry where you're really directly challenging the conservative Asian society where we don't talk about, you know, female sexuality and such. How are you in this business and, and, and what motivates you, my dear? Exactly. I think I'm in a very interesting industry. And for me, it's, it's a no brainer. It's a so natural for me because I feel like I'm solving a problem that I myself faced when I was young, right? Breaking the taboos, um, facing growing up with the taboos and the society stigmatization around sex, sexual wellness, sexual health. So yeah, it's, it just makes a lot of sense for me. It's so natural for me to be in this industry. But Meryl, um, are you helping people of your generation or do you think that you could also reach you know, uh, somebody say, like, your parents' generation, For the sure. ones who, who really sure. cut out that topic <laughs> of sexuality, right? I'm really targeting from the youngsters, the universities, and all the way up. So I'm really tackling topics, for example. We're holding a lot of different workshops, workshops from painful sex, but also workshops about how do mothers talk to their kids about sex because it's something that is so underspoken and that's something that we really want to tackle. And we're also handling conversations, even in the later stage, even for myself to learn in the future about menopause. That's it's also part of sexual health and wellness. So it's really broad ranging that it's not just targeting about the youths of today, but really changing the next generation of societies. How do parents teach their kids about sexual health and wellness? I'm sure you have a lot of women who, you know, would be happy to share their stories as well. And, yep. you know, it's about women sharing and helping everyone else. You heard what Minister Teo said earlier, um, that you don't have to be a CEO to be defined as a successful woman. How did that resonate with you? 
I totally agree. I always felt that I was a leader, whatever I did. <laughs> you know, be be a student, uh, be a uh, scientist, be a CEO. Right now, I felt that I was giving my best, and that I am the best version of myself. Um, yes, as a, in in a career, you want to go ahead. You want to go ahead. You you can move horizontally or vertically. There are some people who decide to go horizontally. They decide to shift, and I did that for a while by by being. a scientist and then moving into business and sort of dabbling on different things to decide what i really like and i realized i want to be a scientific entrepreneur at the end of the day and that's a very odd word because it's not a very common term that you use for yourself and um i think it totally resonates and one of the things that resonated with me as part of today's talk was a lot of people mentioned that it's sort of impossible to have it all Mm. You know when you decide to be a leader women leader specifically women leader you do have to prioritize between career or work and i've heard indra nui you know nui say this as well and i totally agree with it when you decide to be a ceo and a women leader you do prioritize career over work, you know career over family which is fine i mean you you don't have to feel guilty about it you don't have to feel like oh my god what am i doing In fact, you are making sure that you have a support system that can take care of your family, be it your partner, be it your parents, be it a helper, whatever it is, you make sure that that happens and you are at peace when you're at work so you can concentrate on work and sustain that leadership. Mm. So that's exactly what I chose to do eventually. I have a son, but I know my son looks up to me, but I know I have a support system who can take care of my son very well such that I don't have to worry about him mm. if i'm spending extra hours at work well i'm really happy for you and you know i'm glad it's all working out uh but meryl just some closing thoughts on you know what mrs tio said and then i also have one more question for you so sure. why don't you start with uh, um, you know th- role yeah, models and role such models. yeah i think um definitely what mrs josephine tio mentioned about how we can define our own success i think there was something that really resonates with me and i totally agree that we shouldn't be guilty we should totally be very unapologetic and i think in different stages of life we also want different things yes. and it's okay to change your mind it's not that you said one one time that is okay, career is it and that i think in the later stage of my 30s that i would change my mind and say i want to prioritize family and take a back seat and i think that's totally okay and i hope that more women be more courageous to be themselves you know yeah yeah so at good vibes i mean it's not a male dominated industry yeah. it is it is an industry you chose where you are really a pioneer right and it's 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 you dictating the, the future honestly do you think you're going to have it easier in a field that is not male dominated am i going to have it easier Mm. Entrepreneurship <laughs> is a tough job. I mean, two of you. It is a tough know. question. Yeah. Um, I think the industry itself is already very challenging. Yeah. But it's a very fun and very exciting industry because I don't actually have anyone to look up to to just copy or to follow. So I'm really a trailblazer, just paving the way that I think makes sense. And I'm really glad to have a whole community of women that's behind me supporting this journey. So it's a pleasure. Okay, so trailblazer is your thing. Do you consider yourself a trailblazer in oh, any way? Oh, for sure, definitely. Sonia, how? Definitely. I love it that she called herself a trailblazer <laughs> Isn't that because great? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel that as well. I am a trailblazer because I have done something that nobody ever has. I mean, when we started Shiok Meats, first ever cultivated meat company in Singapore and Southeast Asia, first ever woman founded company, first ever company to look at cultivated crustaceans. Were we eating that meat today, by the way? Sorry. <laughs> we weren't eating that meat today, were we today? No, oh, some yeah, of the vegetarian dishes. Okay, all right. Next year, next year. Okay, okay. And that's how you're a trailblazer. Amazing. You two have been great. Thank you for joining us today on International Women's Day. Happy Women's Day. Happy, Happy Women's, Day. Women's Day. Thank, Thank you. you. And of course, we've been enjoying the company of Dr. Sandhya Shriram, who's group CEO, co-founder and chairman of Shop Meats, and Ms. Meryl Lim, who's co-founder and um a hedonist. The <laughs> company's Good Vibes. Guys, thank you so much for having joined us at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022. I hope you've had an inspiring afternoon. And if you missed any of the segments today, if you'd like to revisit any of the best bits, tune in to CNA on the 15th and the 16th of March, 11 p.m. and also 12 p.m. Singapore Hong Kong time. We'll have everything out for you and also anytime revisit this channel, all the chats are there. My name's Yasmin Yonkers. I hope to see you next year. Thank you for joining us at the CNA Leadership Summit 2022 Women Inspiring Change and I have to end by saying this happy International Women's Day